Good afternoon. I'm going to convene meeting six of the Community Safety Advisory Commission. Uh, it's good to see everyone. Um, I want to get started on time because uh, we have a lot to go through you know, on the agenda. I am going to dispense with individual introductions uh, today. There are a lot of folks in the room. We absolutely, I know, will meet many of our guests in just a few minutes. In terms of business, I would like a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor, indicate by saying aye by raising your hand. Thank you. Uh, so let me just uh, talk a little bit about how we're going to make this work today. Um, we have a number of different topics to uh, cover under CPD community outreach. So as we go through this, we're not going to take questions. Um, and I've left it up to the chief to manage the time in the first group and then in the second group. So we will have a present presentations that will get us to 240. We'll take a break and then we'll have presentations that will take us to 335. Now, this is what I need to make an apology uh, uh, around choosing today as a meeting and having it to go for four hours. I neglected to take into account that the National Urban League Conference starts today and that there is a big community event at First Church of God at 7 o'clock, uh, the State of Black America, and then there's another event at 8.30, and there are several of us in this room who have to be at all of those things. And so this is what I'm going to try to do. Uh, when you see that group discussion, that's when we're going to have a chance to talk, you know, just ask questions, but also to try to also get to some of the things that maybe would have had at tabletop, so my idea is that we will not break into tabletop discussions. We'll have one big discussion that we've heard. And my goal is that we would be finished today's session by 4.30. So we may be a little rushed, but that's what the goal is. Any questions or concerns? No? Then I think we're ready to get started. George, are you doing the first introduction? Or is it the chief? OK. Oh, and one other thing, we are being recorded um, for this to be shown later on YouTube. So when we get to the point where you are speaking, even if you don't think um, the, your microphone is working, it really is. So please make sure that you speak into the microphone so we can pick up your voice, okay? Question, Chair Jackson, did you want to update the group on um, the subcommittees? Oh, <laughs> one other. Uh, agenda item, thank you. So at the last meeting, I think I announced that we knew that we would have at least one subcommittee on uh, hiring. Let me just share with you that I'm, we're still working on that, and before the meeting on August the 20th, uh, you will receive um, a communication from us outlining the specific subcommittees that we have and probably with your chair having chatted with individuals about leading that work. So we'll be ready. And Elon, it is my understanding that on Monday night, this past Monday night, the contract was approved. So um, uh, per Brian uh, Clark, who is not here today, he has shared with me that I believe that council, city council has um, approved um, the contract with Matrix. So who will be the uh, consultant who will come on board? And so uh, what will happen at this point that is being negotiated right now, um, and then we should hopefully have them on board soon. So one of the first steps uh, that they will do when, once they get on board is come meet with the commission. So hopefully we'll have more information to you all soon by the next meeting about what those timelines look like. And also, if you still have your list of the topics that we shared at our very, I think, first meeting, I would ask you to add a couple of additional topics. We think that we're going to have a meeting on juvenile issues, uh, specifically in terms of interaction with uh, CPD, and we are probably going to have one on race and justice. So those would be added. I can't tell you that they're going to still stay you know, necessarily one after the other, but we'll work out the planning around those. So uh, juvenile issues and race and justice, disproportionate impact. Okay? 
One more thing, sorry. <laughs> um, at our last meeting, uh, we had um, Randall Sistruck, who was the interim deputy director at Office of Diversity and Inclusion, present the um, diversity recruitment plan. And so we know that there probably wasn't enough time for you all to give feedback to that plan. So if you can send any recommendations for Randall and uh, uh, the chief here for that plan, please send them to either myself or Brian, and we can make sure to get the, your recommendations back to them. Please have those to us by August 10th. And this is a complete aside, and I don't know if I saw it on Facebook or somewhere, but has our department created some type of rep that's a part of recruitment? That will be part of today's presentation. Okay, <laughs> I, I hear it has gotten a lot of hits. Okay, so we'll see that. Great, good. Well, good afternoon, members of the commission. Thank you again for your opportunity to speak today. Uh, on behalf of the Chief of Police, Kim Jacobs, uh, she, this is a uh, topic that she's very passionate about and uh, very much personally involved in uh, the relationships that the Division of Police builds with the community and the dialogues we have. She would be here personally to present this as she wanted to be. Uh, she's uh, out of state right now, so uh, I'll be presenting on her behalf, and I appreciate your attention. I'd also like to introduce uh, Deputy Chief Ken Keebler is joining us today. He's the Acting Chief of Police uh, while she's away. He's right over here. Okay. Everyone knows 365 days in a year. Everyone, we've already talked about the number of runs we take, the type of activity we're involved in. Uh, what does the commission think, just in general, on the uh, impact or amount of um, community, positive community engagement? Not talking about just interactions uh, spontaneously on the street, but issues where we have three, four, five, sometimes 30 or 40 officers assigned to an actual community event to be present and interact with a dialogue with some type of positive encounter uh, by design. Um, what would what would the commissioners think you know, we should be doing a year on that just as a off top of your head? Anybody want to offer anything? Yes, a number. What, you know, 365 days a year, how, how many events should we be sending police officers to understand we have a balance between respond to calls for service and proactive policing what's um, the commission have any thoughts on where we should be at on there every day, every day? so 365 encounters would be uh, appropriate anyone else and it maybe doesn't fall specifically in what you have here and I'll just quickly say that I saw one Saturday and you probably don't count it I volunteered to work for, for the Alvis Amethyst family picnic that happens every yes. year. And there were three officers there, and I'm sure they were working special duty. But I watched them in the most positive interactions with the children uh, and, and the family. So these are folks that maybe they had come across before because they certainly have served time. So you may not count those, but I would count it because it was a very, very positive interaction with a large group of individuals and, and with our officers. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that's a very good point. What we're going to talk about tonight is the ones we actually document, the ones we specifically count. And I think you'll be impressed with these numbers. Here's the numbers of what we actually count of positive interactions. Not all the time special duty officers are present or anything else, but in a year, 3,800 events where we send more than one officer. We're spending three, four, five officers sometimes 30, 40 officers you'll see tonight uh, to different events. On National Night Out, we're sending uh, a large percentage of the, of the um, rank and file out. So that's a positive uh, that I think you can uh, take away from the fact that this is something that's sustained. This is something we can document. We've done it for years, uh, and it's, uh, it's part of our culture. So with that said, I've been asked to break down the uh, handout that, that you were sent into basically four buckets of uh, types of engagement that we do. Uh, our community dialogue and outreach, we have our youth initiatives, we have our um, communications, and then we also have the assignments that we have that are specific to uh, officers that do just that, go out and positively engage with the community. So with that said, I'd like to invite uh, Commander Bob Meter up. The way this is gonna work is I don't want you just to hear from me what we do. I want you to see the people who actually are in the field doing this every day. 
we can from the top down say, oh, we do these things, and we can show you 3,800. Um, and excuse me, just one second. I forgot to bring this up. This is what we document in a year. This is eight point font. And these are, I'll pass this around. It's brought once, so I don't want to kill a lot of trees. But these are the events we do every year that we just talk about up here that we're counting. This is how much we're doing. So I'll pass this around while uh, Commander Meter's talking. Um, but we're going to go over uh, these topic areas. One thing that I want to note, I just found out when I got here. There's some video in here, like the rap video and stuff. We may have an issue because of the cameras took over the audio system here. And because of that, the sound may not play. So we're, we're going to maybe try to figure out the technical difficulties on that. But that's something that I'm unable to control at this point. So with that said, I'll introduce Commander Bob Meter. He's over our uh, training bureau, and he runs a lot of these programs. Thanks, Chief. Welcome, everybody. Good to see you all again in an official capacity. Uh, to build on what the chief just said, if the audio doesn't work, uh, chief, as you know, uh, we actually have the rapper here, and he could do it live. So that's outstanding. So that's some really good. So uh, and and he's always got a smile. So uh, the the training bureau. Uh, in, in the bigger scope of thing, uh, does not have the largest role for community engagement, but we do some really positive things. So we're going to begin by talking about Citizens Police Academy, then we're talking about CRACE, which is the Civilian Response to Active Shooter, and then the Kids Summer Camp. We do touch community in other ways, and actually some other presenters will talk about other things we do at the Academy. But to begin is the Citizens Police Academy. This began in 1993 and is actually the uh, uh, the brainchild of Chief Jacobs. When she was in a different role in the organization, she went ahead and developed this. And this provides an opportunity for the community to come in to learn about the Columbus Division of Police as a whole, not just training. And these next two slides are the week to week. Uh, this is what it currently looks like. We run two of these a year. We run run in the spring, we've already had one, and then we'll be running this one in the fall. So as you see these different weeks, uh, they're three hours, they're in the evening. We vary the week, days of the week for each class. Uh, so one, one uh, the spring it may be a Wednesday, and then in the fall it may be a Tuesday, as people have bowling nights or other kids events on certain nights of the week. So we do vary those uh, days of the week. And, uh, but this is the typical agenda that goes through, and it is 13 weeks in total. And I would just draw your attention to number eight there. Uh, this is something that's relatively new. We bring back the alumni. Everybody that's graduated is invited back. And we'll, we'll spend a, a whole evening on a topic that they didn't get. This most recent class, we did a whole night on human trafficking. So it was very well attended. Several hundred people came back uh, who were past graduates. And we invite all of those back of uh, who would like for us to have maintained contact with them. So this is something that anybody can sign up for. And our staff uh, presents this. And it is held at the academy. However, uh, there are field trips that go to the horse barn or go down to the crime lab, go to the radio room, there, uh, heliport. There's different places that we go. Next is the CRACE class. So CRACE is Civilian Response to Active Shooter. This was developed uh, by a national group, and we picked up delivering it in 2015 in conjunction with the Franklin County Sheriff's Office. Uh, right now, if in a company would like to have CRACE, they can sign up through the Franklin County Sheriff's Office or through the Columbus Division of Police Training Bureau. And this is one of our prim primary instructors, which is Officer Larry Nelson. He is a uh, member of our team at the Training Bureau. And just uh, for example, uh, so far this year, we've had 20 classes uh, just delivered by our team, uh, totaling over 700 attendees. And this is to train people what to do during an active shooter or an active violence in a work or school environment. The third way we touch the community is through the children's summer camp. The children's summer camps are ran through the parks and recs, but then they are delivered to uh, both police and fire for the week. They spend, uh, there are four camps per, uh, per year. The age breakdown, we run two camps from ages 9 to 11, and the other are ages 12 to 15. 
Um, the camp is five days in length. Uh, they, uh, I believe they go to Schiller Park and then they're shuttled to the division twice um, for two of the days. The other two days are spent at, at uh, fire. So here's just some random photographs from the kids' camp. And, they, and this is what they do on day one. You see the agenda, and we actually take them on a field trip over to the heliport, which is always uh, well, a time that the kids do look forward to. And then on day two, we, uh, we go through a series of events there at the academy, and then we have them, uh, a tour of the, or of, the, uh, of the horse barn and the mounted unit. And then the other two days, they're spent at uh, Columbus Fire, and I believe that they are taught to uh, um, sleep and eat in groups, but I, I got it. I'm not confirmed with that. But um, then they also have a graduation day that's on Friday, and two of the four camps are held at Columbus Division of Police, and the other two are held at Columbus Fire. And those are the three ways that we, primary ways, we touch the community. Thank you, Chief. Okay, the uh, Exploration Camps is actually part of our youth initiative, so uh, normally that would be in a different bucket, but since he's presenting, I just kept him in line there. Um, one thing you're going to notice throughout these pictures, they have well, basically what you're going to have up here is just running pictures in the background. Listen to the speaker, but see the pictures. If you want to know something about make note of it, we'll explain it in maybe a little bit more detail. You're going to see the mounting unit throughout this. I have uh, Officer Mike Cameron here today that's uh, going to come up in a little bit and talk to you about the mounting unit without a necessary presentation because he's in so much of it. That's everything we do. They're assigned our community liaison uh, bureau because that's what their assignment is, is to have these positive interactions. Uh, with that said, we also have a lot of programs with uh, <clears throat> that uh, Lieutenant Scott Barthlow runs for us. She does a fantastic job with all these programs uh, without Lieutenant Barthlow, without target um, support, uh, would not occur. So uh, he's going to explain some of these programs and what we do. And uh, this is really, uh, there's literally thousands and thousands of pictures we have in files for over the years. So I just took a sampling just to kind of have something visually for you to look at. Uh, but the real information is, is what uh, Lieutenant Barthel is going to explain about what we have going on. Uh, that's. Uh, Introduce uh, Lieutenant Scott Barthlow. Hello, thanks for having me. Um, first off, is there anybody here that's involved in our block watches in their neighborhoods? Are you? Very good. Um, the first slide we're doing here is our national night out. It's basically the Super Bowl for our block watches. This is the night where all our block watches can get together and celebrate. And um, the big thing I like to point out is when they're there is to meet the new neighbors that have moved in their neighborhoods, but also get reacquainted with your older neighbors. Because if you know who lives in your neighborhood, it's very good opportunities that you know when the crime is happening in your neighborhood also because you know who belongs and who doesn't. So anyhow, uh, next Tuesday is our national night out. It's going to be held from 6 to 8. We have about 134 events right now scheduled throughout the city. Um, some of them start as just a porch light vigil, which is what national night out was first originally formed as. Um, and 35 years ago, they decided to do this. Uh, the division started participating in this in 1998, so we've been doing this for quite a while. But uh, a lot of the communities will have porch light vigils, and that means they put their porch lights on. It's basically to tell crime. It's a height prevent, crime prevention awareness, generate support for participation in local anti-crime programs, strengthen neighborhoods of spirit and police community partnerships, but also send a message to the criminals, let them know that the neighborhoods are organized and fighting back. Now, this is uh, throughout the years, it's spawned out now that we have cookouts, we have ice cream parties, we have movie nights. We have uh, different events now that take place on the weekends because it's gotten so big that they can no longer have it on that one night. We have uh, different organizations that get street permits where they block off the whole street now and have one giant block party. So it's really spawned to be a really great event throughout the year, and it's one of the, the better things that we do here at the Community Liaison Section. Um, they, uh, basically, we do have a national competition that's applied to National Night Out. We have to apply for through uh, the the agency. Uh, last year we became, we, kept, we ranked sixth overall throughout the United States for any cities at 300,000 or more. So some of the places we've lost out to was like Arlington, Texas, Los Angeles County, and Chesterfield County. So, you know, if Franklin County would join together, I think we'd be the biggest one in the, in the, in the country, but then that would take the uh, spotlight off of Columbus, so we don't want to do that either. We like to, we like to be our own. I'm fine. I got sixth. We can do good. So, um, for National Night Out. How do you, before they get to the next topic? 
So the other stuff we do is uh, heroes and helpers. Just get a second here. To... Oh. So you'll have to see oh. the last uh, couple slides oh. here. There's... Um, the one thing that's important about this is you can see this is all the way from officers all the way up to um, the director and city council members, the chief, everyone is involved in this. So again, this is an organizational thing. This is not just something we send officers out as an assignment to do. This is something that we believe in, everybody participates in uh, broadly and sustained over many years. So um, that said, we'll go into heroes and helpers. All right. So heroes and helpers, uh, about seven years ago when I came over to the unit, Target approached us and they wanted to do uh, basically a shop with a cop program. Um, and I said, oh, that's great. So they came over and they gave us a grant. So Target's our, our principal's partner right now. However, we've branched out and like CME, the FOP and other agencies now have been helping out. But basically what we looked at is we want to reward the kids that are going to the Columbus Public Schools that are doing a good job. So what we do is we partner with the city schools, our CLOs that will be talked about a little bit. They work with the uh, public school districts throughout the year for all different programs. And w the, um, the highlight there is that we like, to, we like to identify at least one kid in the school to, that does really well in school, comes every day, participates, doesn't cause any problems, but maybe could use a help, little help during the Christmas time. And those are the ones we like to try to focus on. And uh, it's worked out really well because we have the school involvement in this. The school is the one that picks out the kids. They're the ones that nominate them. And um, the best thing about it is a lot of times the school will be the principal or the teacher will actually bring the kid to the event because the parents either didn't want to participate or they don't want to have the transportation to get the kid there. And um, it's just an amazing night. I mean, I got all my officers uh, that participate, and most of the time the officers double the money that was already given to the kid, which they, they pull out of their own pockets to help out. Um, we started off doing 20 kids a year. Last year we was able to get to 40 kids. Each of them gets $100 to shop at Target, and like I said, each of those kids usually get about $200 because my guys are just so great, and they, uh, they always chip in. We've, um, make sure I hit everything and get in the first one. But basically, we usually do about the week before Christmas, so that way we get them. Uh, Target's always been great. They uh, wrap their presents for us. They always have treats for the kids. Um, they have refreshments and all that good stuff, so it's always a great night. I mean, it, it, the best part about that is when you, you talk to the parents or whatever, when they call an RSV or anything else, and they said, you know what, we didn't know what we was going to do for our kids this year for Christmas. This is the best thing you could do, and they're in tears because we're able to give their kid a Christmas, and that just makes me feel good each, each and every year. Um, the other section we do, this is, this is based on all, everything the community liaison section does, which will be talked later by a couple of my officers. They're going to talk about the block watch. They're going to talk about the CLO role in general. But the homeless outreach is another thing that's come to our attention. Um, basically, I sit on the board of the Homeless Outreach Commission. It's, it's formed the, the primary chair is Director Emerald Hernandez. She works for the mayor's office. And um, we meet uh, once a month with uh, code enforcement, ODOT, uh, park rangers, um, Mary Havens, our, our main, number one sponsor, uh, as far as doing the outreach for us, and uh, we meet once a month. We talk about different areas. As you can see, some of these areas get pretty bad. I mean, as far as the trash and debris, and the cleanups usually run anywhere between twenty and thirty thousand. Like this picture here, this guy has actually a house on the river. As a, that's not this cam, but he has a house on the river. His toilet basically runs through a PVC pipe into the river. So obviously, you got health violations, code violations. So it's engaging these people because they don't want to be in the system. They don't want to be in the shelters. They want to live on their own. But it's trying to get them housing and get them out because a lot of times it's because of warrants or something else. So we're, uh, Director Hernandez now is working with the Franklin County Courts trying to find a way to remediate their warrants to say if they get off the streets and they get into housing, they can uh, adjudicate their warrants through a system of work equity or something like that. And um, it, this is what we was, that was the um, bridge that goes over top of the freeway. It was just littered with stuff. And there's after we cleaned it, that was about thirty or forty thousand dollars that it cost us just the city alone to clean up, let alone what ODOT had to clean up off to the sides there, because ODOT has a property where those trees are at, and underneath the bridge. Um, I don't know if you had the slide. There's one slide we have over that bridge, underneath the bridge. They had so many propane tanks that were given away by these churches that if they were to caught fire, they probably would have taken the bridge out. It's just amazing the amount of debris and all the stuff here is what what's uh goes on with the homeless camp. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to work with Mary Haven and the city to try to adjudicate them, try to get them into housing, 
try to get them off the streets and and the proper housing. And then the drug programs, you want to mention that? Yeah. And then the drug program, um, real quick, is uh, just about a month ago we got these uh, we got these packets. Was he donated to us? How much? Because this came when I was on vacation. Um, so we got these donations of packets, but it's basically one way that you can dispose of your uh, medications. For those that are, you know, my grandmother was in hospice for a while when she passed. We had so many medications laying around the house, you don't know what to do with them all. You can't just throw them in the trash. You can't throw them in the, in the uh, you can't flush them because obviously it goes through the filter system. So we had to find a way to do them. And um, the city basically got these donated to them. So we're getting these down at our block watches and handing them out through the community liaison section. But basically you can rip it off here. You put the pills in here. You shake it up, there's a powder, and it dissolves them, but then you can just mail them in, and it goes there. Other agencies, it's, um, smaller agencies, can put a drop box in their police stations where you can drop the drugs off. What we do in Columbus is twice a year we partner with narcotics in one of the local hospitals. We do a drug take back day. We use that with social media to get the information out. Um, so that way people can just drive through. They don't have to get out of their car. They drive through. They hand us their narcotics. We put it in a bag. We give it, we put it in a sealed container and then it's taken to narcotics and then to our property room and they dispose of them all in one big bunch. But these will be coming out in our block watches into our community group soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, block watch programs are a big part of what we do. So I'm going to bring Officer Kelly Shea up from our community liaison section. She's been seeing a lot of these photos, and uh, she'll kind of go over our block watch programs. And there's a handout for you as well on the programs. Officer Shea. Good afternoon. I'm Officer Kelly Shea. I'm one of the 20 community liaison officers you've heard tell about. Um, and what I'm going to talk to you about, the lieutenant touched on a lot of the uh, other things we do. We do um, presentations, block watch meetings, civic associations, area commissions, all kinds of uh, community events. But we started uh, back in the 90s um, mainly as uh, a group that helps uh, neighborhood groups form block watches. This is kind of the meat and potatoes of what we do. And I pass out the handbook. The handbook is a guideline on what a block watch is, how do you form a block watch. And basically, we help facilitate your community groups into being a, an active uh, community organization within their neighborhood. Uh, it encourages a sense of community, it encourages activism, and it encourages people to get out of their houses and get to know one another. And one of the things people like about it is they like having an officer that they can, someone, you know, skin and bones that they can see, they can talk to. Because oftentimes 311 is great, you call, you, you ask for a police officer, they have minimal, minimal time. We have more time to sit down and really listen to the members of our community and find out what their concerns are and try to come up together as a group, this is a partnership, remember, with, come up with some sort of solution long term. Patrol officers co come to your house and they fix the problem, it's a short term fix. When you have long term problems, when you have an issue in the community that's going to take uh, investment from members of the community, from outside agencies, you want someone that can help guide you with that. And we work closely with not only our, our community members, but with other government organizations, with the schools, again, like I mentioned, the civic, uh, civic associations and the, the um, area commissions, so we have those contacts that we can bring in depending on the issue and, and address the problem. So back to a block watch, what is a block watch? It's the eyes and ears. We don't ask anybody to go out and take action, we don't ask anybody to be a vigilante, we ask them to be eyes and ears of our community, we stress that. We want people to be aware of what's happening and to inform us so again we can, we can work uh, in conjunction as a partnership to address the issues. Um, as you'll see at the, uh, at the bottom of the um, page two, it's through community mobilization, neighbors, businesses, coworkers, students form an active partnership in the community. So again, it's a partnership. Um, to form a block watch, 
basically we ask that we have, again, it's, it's a buy-in. You need a buy-in from the community. So the people who come to us who want to start a block watch, we put the onus back on you. Get your community involved. How can we help you do that? And we ask you to get, bring people to the table that are interested, get the word out, and there's many different ways you can do that. You can do that going door to door, handing out flyers, you can call people. Social media is a great tool, we use that a lot. Get the word out, get people to an initial meeting. And in order to actually be established as a block watch, you have to go through a series of uh, three meetings, the fourth being uh, where you're actually dubbed an official block watch. But the first few meetings, we want to make sure that, again, we have skin in the game. We have people who are interested, people who are going to consistently show up. And we ask that you uh, invest your time. And we want to see that that community has that support. So we have do an initial meeting where we talk about personal safety. The next meeting, we may talk about residential safety. Um, and then it, after uh, we've been established, that it's been established that we're going to have community support, and you're going to have people show up, then we have a form where we file you down as an official block watch. And again, the lieutenant talked about uh, the, one of the biggest events we have with our block watches yearly is a national night out program, in addition to uh, other community events. Sorry, did I mess that up for you? That's all right. So total, in the city currently, we have 100, I'm sorry, 327 active block watches. So again, that's a span of 20 precincts, and we have 327 active block watches. We have 45 inactive, and what is inactive? That just means that they don't necessarily meet on a regular basis. But, so a total of around 400 block watches in the city. And again, we've been doing this since uh, the mid-90s. So we were involved in um, the community policing uh, game probably before it became, became you know, the, the popular term that it is today. So we got to jump on this. We've been doing this for a long time. Anything okay. I missed? No, that's good. All right. Thank you for your time. Okay, Dr. Jindal, uh, we'd like to uh, welcome you up here. Um, I reached out to uh, Dr. Jindal. You can come on up. Thank you. I reached out to him on uh, Monday, really late notice. Uh, I'm very appreciative. Uh, he is one of our biggest supporters. Uh, he is on our diversity recruiting council. Uh, he also works with us and the FBI and DHS uh, from Washington, uh, meeting with communities uh, that have special interest in the community and uh, has just been a great partner for us. I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about what the uh, diversity recruiting council is and how we utilize that for our recruiting purposes. Uh, Dr. Jindal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, beside my so many achievements, in young age, I have achievement of slow walking, slow talking, and sometimes my brain freeze. So please forgive me. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, Namaste, this is Indian greeting, and it means that I and you are the same together, and I bow my head to the divinity within you. <laughs> Thanks to our mayor, who just created this council, and though CRC, Community Relations Commission, was trying and to have this council for last four years. We are very fortunate to have you here, and thank you, council, for uh, doing this effort and taking these pain and knowing each other well. I feel sharing the responsibility makes things easy. In our community centers and worship places, we put information what to do if it stopped to come home. We also discuss with our young generation and give suggestions about these situations. That is our responsibility as so-called community leaders to just inform 
and educate our youngsters. We don't uh, expect that only law officers take, take us and take us and community as a friend, but uh, we also take them as friends and part of the community. We invite them in our community events and uh, also not as a security guard, but as friends and to participate. That is what I mean that uh, we also, as a community, invite them and try to develop the relationship instead of expecting that they make friendship with us. Out of nine, 1,900, only about 1,300 law officers on the street take care, protect, and help about more than one and a half million people in Greater Columbus. We can understand the responsibility and load of work. We, the so-called, again, community leaders, must convey positive and constructive message to the community. In the end, very important thing, in 2000, when Minority Recruiting Council was established by Mayor Coleman, my first thought was to know these people behind the uniform, and I found they are exactly like us, with the same human emotions of uh, sorrow, pain, and happiness, and love. I attended Police Citizens Academy, Franklin County Sheriff Citizens Council, and FBI Citizens Academy to know the real action of duty. If we want to know more beyond TV and news media clips, I will request to this council to attend the regular session of Police Citizens Academy to make practical and right suggestions and recommendations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jindal. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, Commander Jen Knight, who's going to go over some of their community di dialogue um, and uh, other outreach that we do uh, in the community. Uh, she is going to talk about this picture in just a minute. First, we're going to start. Uh, she's the um, Zone 4 commander, uh, which is just north of downtown, up through campus, and uh, she'll uh, fill you in on kind of what we do in this regard. Good afternoon, I'm Commander Jennifer Knight and I'm told to stand by the podium. This is really hard for me. So I will stand in this spot as best I can and I'm gonna tell you about some of the projects, the engagement opportunities and dialogues that our officers have on a regular basis that connect them to the community. And I'm also gonna talk about service projects that we do. And we want to develop a service mindset with our officers, so we start that in the academy. Officers that are in the academy are required to do four hours of uh, service to the community and they do that service to places like Ronald McDonald House and other places. And we do that for a real reason. We want to instill a mindset at a time when we're developing these officers that this is an important part of being a police officer. And engagement with your community but a service mindset is one of the things that we instill at, at that very, very important time. Our officers volunteer on panels. I don't know if you're aware of this, but that we do this on a regular basis for open discussions and we discuss things like community policing, uh, the impact of bias, 
social justice, use of force incidents, and a variety of other topics. And they do that through some of the universities in the area. I know Capital Law School has one every semester. They have forums for their students and for the community, and I've served on several of those panels, so have other officers, and we volunteer to go over there and give a law enforcement perspective and answer questions. And those are open dialogues, and, and it's a real opportunity. Some of these panels are quite large. Uh, there have been panels at the Ohio State Bar Association. I've served on a few of those where we're talking to young lawyers, and that's an interesting uh, group of people to talk to, the other side of law enforcement. And so our officers do this on a regular basis. We also had a panel recently for um, Ohio clergy that were in town for a conference, and it was actually about 250 people, 300 in the room, and we were invited to speak there and talk about the safety of their membership and their communities when they come to church every week. So we put on a panel discussion for that as well. This is something that occurs on a regular basis and our officers volunteer to do these types of things and it connects them to the community. Sustained Dialogue at OSU is a project that started, uh, Chief, was it about three or four years ago maybe? OSU put together a program where they brought in their students and community members and some of their staff and we would sit down with law enforcement officers from the area, OSU officers, a lot of Columbus police officers, and we would have a meal together. And it was a really different approach to sit down and share a table and break bread with individuals that you hadn't met before, law enforcement and then students. And then we had a mediator at each table and we would talk about some really tough issues and it's been going on for three or four years now and I will tell you it's one of the most interesting conversations we have. And that sustained dialogue at OSU brings about 30 to 40 officers that volunteer to come to that and we have a great time and we've made a lot of good friends from that. There's a lot of participation in activities that bring people together that you may not think about. One of the most recent ones is a 5K race that occurred on the hilltop. There are no races, 5Ks, on the hilltop. And um, I participated in that. Lots of officers came out to, to be there. We had the mounted unit, we had safe streets, and we had the recruiting unit there. And it was designed to bring the community together, but the police officers that were there were leading the charge. We wanted to make sure. And we had about 350 participants in the first 5K on the hilltop, bringing running to the west side. We also, uh, our officers participate in the Special Olympics Torch Run. You're gonna see a theme here, there's a lot of running going on. We want our officers to keep fit, we want them to get the community fit, so they do the Law Enforcement Torch Run every year, and they carry the torch for the Special Olympics all the way into the stadium. And that runs through Ohio, and we have hundreds of officers participate in that. They also have a race for the CURE team. We have a law enforcement race for the CURE team, a CPD team, and we raise money every year for that as well. And that's one of the pictures, uh, those are pink hats. And we had a race for the CURE card. It was a really fun thing for us to do, and um, we spend a lot of time and energy preparing for that. One of the things I wanna mention is the Neighborhood Pride Initiative that we have going, and there's two components to this. We have Neighborhood Pride Centers, which kind of act like a community fusion center to bring other city departments in and represent those departments and they have space there and they work on some of the community issues that we have and it brings everyone together. But there's also the neighborhood pride event, which is every year city departments kind of converge on a neighborhood and they execute various city resources in that neighborhood and it's kind of a very robust strategy where the trees are trimmed, the housing violations are addressed, and cars are towed, and it's kind of an all hands on deck kind of thing, and we participate in that as well. That kind of pride, it kind of evolves into like a pride week for that neighborhood. It consists of early planning by our CLOs. They work with the other officers to address issues in that area, and this isn't just law enforcement. In fact, most of the issues that we're dealing with are community issues, they're not law enforcement issues. They become law enforcement issues because these neighborhoods, it's a component of what really needs to change in these neighborhoods. And so we are part of that conversation. And at the end of that week, it's really fun, we have a great big barbecue. And zone four, which is my zone up in the Linden area, had our uh, uh, Pride Week 
barbecue at Good Shepherd Church on Hudson, and there were several hundred people that turned out for that, and there was a lot of food, and we had a really good time. So we do that on a regular basis as well. Officers are also involved in community service opportunities, and this is something that people don't necessarily think about when they see their police officer. We do community service all the time. They volunteer in their communities, but they also volunteer to do stuff in our own communities, or in the communities they work. So um, we have everyday service engagement opportunities, and one of the things that we did, and I, it got a little bit of uh, news coverage this year, but we found out our Linden officers found out that the high school basketball team at Linden McKinley didn't have anybody to provide meals before their games, away games or home games. We found out that these, these kids come to school and they have lunch at noon and then they have to play a basketball game and they don't have parents. And a lot of you will understand that normally the parents cover that. Well, there was a gap at Linden McKinley. We found out about it. Uh, Sergeant Dana Hess, who is going to be talking later, kind of coordinated this. The officers stepped up, they got meals, they served meals, and they took care of the basketball team for all of their games. And this was not something anyone asked us to do. We saw this gap and we couldn't believe it. We were like, we've got to help these kids. It was wonderful. Um, I do remember the safety director's office contributing quite a bit of funds. We got some local businesses, Donato's, gave us a ton of pizzas one day. We covered all their games, and guess what? We also found out the girls team didn't have that, so we decided to take care of the girls basketball team as well. That's something that you don't see maybe on the news or anything like that. So we fill those gaps when we see them on a regular basis. And the last thing I would like to talk to you about is um, that picture, if you could pull it up. Um, I want to give you a feel-good story to walk away with. This is the kind of thing that happens every day, and the only reason I found out about this is somebody sent me this picture. Uh, this is Ms. Thelma. We, uh, Ms. Thelma called the police on May 6th this year, and Officer Hardwick on second shift arrived at her house, and she couldn't get her door to close. Ms. Thelma is 96 years old. She lives in Linden, and she couldn't fix her door. So the officer showed up, and he fixed her door for her, changed the strike plate, there was a problem with the door, fixed the door. Then realized that she couldn't figure out how to properly close the door because she had this big key, set of keys. He labeled all her keys, showed her how to use them, put little labels and tape across all her keys. He then fixed another screen window and changed a light bulb and spent two hours with Thelma. This is what officers do when they can't get to the next dispatched run. It's people like this that are engaging the community and finding out what's, what's really needed by the individuals that call us. So Ms. Thelma was talking to this officer and said, you know, she just turned 96 and she'd outlived her whole family. And she didn't have anybody to celebrate her birthday with. The very next day, the officer went out and bought her a birthday cake, chocolate is her favorite, and took her back, took it back to her house and had a birthday celebration with Ms. Thelma. Her words to us were, all I have left is God and the police. And we show up and we fix doors and label keys and celebrate birthdays, and those are not the things that you hear about every day, but I will tell you that's what our officers are doing every single day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Commander Knight. Okay, just a couple uh, last minute uh, things on community outreach. Uh, we do a lot of helicopter fly-ins, again, especially around uh, schools and, and kids and teens. Director Stewart, welcome. Um, so we, we do that. That's another feature of, that we try to uh, uh, make sure that the community gets to see and interact with some of the cooler things that, that we do. That's a really positive uh, encounter, just like our mounted unit, like our motorcycles, like our canines. Uh, these are all very popular uh, with everyone. Um, last thing is uh, some listening and interaction events. Um, we have the sustained dialogues that uh, Commander Knight talked about at OSU. Again, we have three, four hundred people show up at these uh, large events. Um, we have uh, Tommy Page, he did the ABCs of Policing for You. We go out to uh, this group you just saw was an all Spanish speaking uh, uh, immigrant population and we used a translator and we went out and provided them the ABCs of policing so they kind of understood a little bit, same thing that you got, understood a little bit about why we do what we do. Someone mentioned a softer uniform. 
you know, why don't maybe go out and talk? The last slide you saw was at a Boys and Girls Club up in London where we did go, uh, as Milo Grogan, uh, we did go in um, dressed down in plain clothes, again, to try to create a little bit more of a connection there. Um, so that was something we did. Uh, go to churches. I was uh, Mayor Ginther for uh, uh, different um, events. Ties that tie, uh, bind, that ties that bind ties. They're uh, go for first day of school and, and tie a child's tie for them and, and uh, spend some time with them. Celebrate one. Uh, officers actually are involved in delivering uh, portable uh, uh, cribs to children when they go to houses and they find that they uh, don't have access to that and they're not sleeping properly. They may be sleeping in bed with a parent. It's not the ABCs of sleeping alone uh, on your back uh, in a crib. So we provide those services. A lot of things, again, the community outreach, community driven that we don't necessarily have to do. Uh, These are things that officers want to do. These are maybe outside of what you th tr traditionally think of law enforcement. But this is policing in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, great dialogue there with the uh, Boys and Girls Club. So these are all things that, that we do uh, on a regular basis and <clears throat> excuse me, uh, are very uh, uh, popular. So uh, with that, any uh, questions on the community outreach and engagement uh, piece? Okay. Once I get started, I, I lose control. <laughs> okay, next thing we're going to do, uh, bring up um, officer, we're going to talk about uh, youth initiatives. First thing we're going to do is talk to uh, Officer Travis uh, Tucker about the police explorers. You already know a little bit about them, um, but this is a great recruiting tool. I want to give you just a little bit of information on that program and see someone that's a success story uh, from that program. Officer Tucker, come on up and introduce yourself. Good afternoon. As the Chief said, my name is Travis Tucker. I've uh, been an officer for seven years now. Uh, besides being a current officer, I'm a former explorer. And I joined the program uh, back in summer 2002. I found out about it uh, through the uh, Jasmine Rib Fest. I was there with my family. And my dad dragged me up to the CPD recruiting booth. And we got to talk to a police officer. And she uh, asked me how old I was. I said I was 14. She asked me if I was ever or if I ever heard of the uh, Explorer program. And so she told me about it and gave me a phone number to one of the advisors at that time. We contacted him and two weeks later I was at my first meeting. And uh, after that meeting, I immediately fell in love with it. Uh, I found myself surrounded by others my age that had that same passion, same interests in law enforcement. Um, it was the first time in my life that I gained leadership skills and as a teenager, uh, gained tremendous confidence in myself. And that one meeting turned into uh, the next three years of my life. I kept going to that program. I really enjoyed it. Made very close friends. Um, what I took away from that program became a foundation of what I carried with me into the military, becoming a police officer, and then remains a part of me, uh, being the man that I am today. So what the program is, though, it's a subsidiary of Boy Scouts of America, supported by Learning for Life. It's directed towards youth between ages 14 and 20 interested in that law enforcement field. Uh, the way we structure our program with Columbus is uh, weekly meetings. At these meetings, we teach them skills, certain skills that it takes to become a police officer. Uh, examples, traffic stops, building searches, and the list goes on. Uh, we do physical fitness. We issue them uniforms. As you can see, uh, our expectation for them is to maintain their own uniform because that teaches them responsibility, discipline, attention to detail. Um, we also partake in the ride along program, so these explorers have the opportunity to go out with the patrol officer for a typical duty day. And these skills that they learn, uh, they can take with them to competitions. We have a statewide competition called Heart of Ohio Regionals, and on the big stage, Nationals, which takes place every two years somewhere in the country. They have the opportunity to compete against other explorers from different posts. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it when I was when I was their age, and um, so besides these skills that we go over, we also teach them the values that we seek in police officers, and we uh, instill them with that same mindset. So obviously, us being the Columbus Police Explorer Program, we adopt the same core values that we instill in our officers in the department: professionalism, respect, integrity, discipline, and enthusiasm. With those values, that builds confidence, motivation, and self-esteem. And uh, 
with that mindset, we also get them involved with community service. As Commander Knight already touched on, we instill that service mindset early on because if you do want to become a police officer, that's a huge aspect of serving your community. We get them involved with fundraisers. Between those two things, uh, not only do they become leaders in the program, they become leaders in the community, in their schools, and uh, hopefully recruiting more kids that way. So one of the goals of the Explore program, um, you're creating a pipeline for these young men and women uh, to one day become a police officer. Currently on the department, we have about 20 uh, CPD officers that are former explorers of our program. We have another, about another 20 uh, that have gone on to other police agencies. And even for those that don't go on to uh, become police officers, our goal is to, is to give them an experience and teach them values that they can take with them to become uh, successful in life. Yes, sir. Thank you, Officer Tucker. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, one of the little, uh, uh, Director Stewart, uh, one of the opportunities this also brings up, uh, we're ready for you, I guess. The, um, this is also a mentoring opportunity. We have a wide array of officers and sergeants and lieutenants in here today. This is an opportunity for them also to come out and engage the community on this level with a commission uh, set by the mayor. It's a good mentoring opportunity, so I'm hoping we see a lot of these uh, uh, men and women uh, start seeking uh, promotion in higher ranks. I think we're gonna, uh, we'll be well served uh, by these members. Next thing we're gonna talk about is uh, TAPS, and Director Stewart's gonna cover that, and I believe, uh, Professor Jones is in there, so. Thanks, sir. Good afternoon. Um, we're gonna talk about a program called TAPS. It's a Teen and Police Service Academy. Um, as you look at this picture, you'll see me in that pretty blue shirt. To my left, the second person is Chief Charles McClellan. Uh, Chief McClellan was the Chief of Police in Houston, Texas. Uh, Chief Quinlan has had the opportunity, uh, I think privilege even, of knowing and working around him. Uh, he started the TAPS initiative back in 2012, I believe. Uh, and it started after a real high profile negative police contact with a youth. Uh, the kid was caught breaking into a home, uh, pursued over high, hill and dale. The officers caught up with him and proceeded to assault him. Nothing more, nothing less. They, they beat him up. Uh, Chief McClellan ended up firing these guys, but at the same time looked for a way to have his officers start interacting with the youth of Houston. Uh, he's very active in that and has always been active in that and felt a real strong uh, connection with the, with the youth of Houston. So in 2012, he or 2011, he tasked one of his assistant chiefs to try to find a program or develop a program that would work and taps as a result of that. Uh, we use TAPS here as an 11-week uh, program designed uh, to deal with or handle or just deal with at-risk kids. I don't like putting terms on people, but that pretty much, uh, that, that explains it. They're at risk. Um, by at risk, I mean kids that have shown a propensity to make bad decisions. Uh, if you have children or been anywhere around kids, you know that they don't always think before they act. So what we have done is taken police officers very much like this. Several of these guys are a part of our TAPS program, uh, and I can't say enough positive things about them. These are the guys who care. Not that we don't all care, but these are the guys that have gone on to make a, a, a statement to their community by their actions to show that they care about these kids, white kids, black kids, Hispanic kids, boys, girls, the kids, period. They don't care. Um, We try to train these kids from at risk to what we like to call, or the TAPS Creed calls, at promise. The curriculum involves things such as bullying, anger management, avoiding gang life, and drug use and conflict management. Police interaction, how to act around the police, what to expect from the police. Um, we started out in the high schools and found that we wanted to try and impact these kids in an earlier age, so we moved to middle schools. Uh, it was a bit of a, a, a two-year battle or two-year journey to get the program introduced into the Columbus City Schools. Uh, 
we did everything they asked us they asked us to do um, but the last challenge was to find funding uh, we found funding initially with the federal program uh, but when that went away so did the program for a while and so we've kind of gone hill and dale trying to find somebody to fund us and found uh, pleasantly surprisingly uh, the judges from the uh, franklin county juvenile court uh, have provided funding for the last two years judge brown and judge gill uh, judge brown being the administrative judge um, if you've ever met her she's, she's she's a joy to be around but she is a very serious person and for her to be convinced that this is a worthwhile program i found myself quite pleased um, she always comes there at graduation she always goes out of the way to interact with each kid each class she even goes and puts on um, moot courts where they'll find a kid who has violated a minor rule or a rule in school and they'll actually have a trial um, it, it's an amazing transformation to see these kids start from that first week uh, and certain Fuqua if he has the opportunity could probably even share with you where they kids walk into a room and they find 10 to 12 13 14 uniform columnist police officers kind of like walking in here and they don't expect it they just know that they're there they've been selected by the schools they've been selected by their principals um, and the principal saying we've got to find a way to help these kids and they walk in and the last thing last place they want to be is in that room we offer them the opportunity we don't force them they're not mandated it's not mandated to that room but after one two-hour session we're able to talk these kids into considering coming back we have never had a kid not come back uh, we had close once uh, a young man uh, out west but um, he, he did, he came back and became actually the recipient to like a, a Christmas, a precinct un, unrelated to TAPS adopted him and his family for a Christmas. Um, and that's the type of thing that you see these kids grow and they, they grow in maturity. But the key to TAPS in my mind, the true key to TAPS is when five or six kids sit at a table with one or two officers and they talk about the topic of the day, whether it be bullying or drugs or some interaction that the police have had locally or nationally. These kids will tell you the truth. They will absolutely tell you the truth. They'll tell you what they think. And the, the, again, again, the key is the response to these guys. They've been trained on how to mentor these kids, not just something they get from the police academy, but we bring two, the two primary sponsors of the program from Houston, Texas every year to train our officers. They're coming again in September, I believe, to train the next level of officers. We've gotten uh, commanders and deputy chiefs that are finding officers on the street that they think would make a good, um, good lead into this program. Uh, Dr. Jones is a national office holder for uh, TAPS. I had no idea when, she, when uh, I first introduced her. I think you were at Ohio Dominican initially. And then she came and helped us put this thing together. We have trained nearly 300, I think it's 284 kids since 2014. And it's just, it, it truly is, it's an emotional, it's an amazing transition that you see in these kids. And, and, and I'll leave you with this. Um, I believe it was the class that's here today, uh, that's, that's pictured on the, the wall here. Um, the first day we found out, the kid didn't want to be there. We found out his father had just been sentenced to multiple years in prison for a series of crimes that he was responsible for. He was bummed out, didn't want to be there in school, period. Then here we go with our white shirts and hats smiling. And he sat down with, uh, I believe, Tony Lowry and Sergeant, or, uh, Sergeant Ally. Um, and they just talked to him. They just talked to him. I truly didn't expect him to come back because, again, it was his choice. He came back the next week and again and again and again. He ended up being uh, the, the auditor order for the class. And the kid spoke his mind. And it was, it, it was truly moving. One last case from, um, I think, Champion Middle School. Young man, same situation, didn't really want to be around the police but ended up being the order 
the week before their graduation, his mom died. Her surgery, was, her, surgery her, her funeral was that Tuesday. That Monday he came to class, or that, it was that Wednesday. That Tuesday he came to class, and he insisted on coming to class to give his speech because the program meant that much to him. There literally wasn't dry eye in the room, including the administration there at school. So I, I say this to you. The officers on this police department, of which I've, the officers on this police department, of which I've had a few years involvement, almost 39 years before I retired, are good quality people. And a positive component is that every one of these guys, to a person who participate in this program, have told us that they are better parents because of this program, because they listened to the problems these kids had. So I thank you for listening. Chief wants me to get out of here, and I'm out. Thank you, Director. Appreciate it. In the interest of staying on time, we're going to uh, bypass the school resource officers and the public uh, expression camps. We already got the public safety camps. I'll bring Officer Will James up to talk about some basketball camps. This is where I might have the uh, technical glitch with the uh, sound. So as he comes up, I'm going to try to play this video if it will work. Um, Well, you can watch, you just want to have the music, but you can see what they do. You can just talk, since it's, the music's not playing, you just talk while they uh, watch the video. Yeah. Hello, I'm Officer Will James, and this is the boot camp we did with Independence High School. Um, the boot camp started off as something very innocent. It was just um, our basketball team having a love for the sport and deciding to go over to uh, South High School and interact and practice with the kids. Um, it was an organic fit for us, being that at the time, my dad was the head basketball coach at South, and then also um, Sergeant Sean Fuqua, who's here, uh, is a graduate of South High School. And so it was just very um, organic in nature, and it, it started off there. Um, it grew after uh, speaking with uh, Commander Meter and deciding that we wanted to use our facilities and bring it over to the police academy to uh, give the kids a different feel, um, give, a, um, give them a different experience, and started to grow from there. Um, we were able to bring in uh, Terrence Dows to speak to uh, the kids, which was very impactful. Um, him telling his story and giving this testimony about um, life situations that occurred and helped shape and mold him and how he got to where he is today, and then also what's after basketball. You know, a lot of these kids grow up with hoop dreams, wanting to play Division I ball, and it doesn't happen like that. And so just being able to stress the, important of, the importance of education and what's next. Um, uh, from there, we, we added other high schools. We added Linden High School. We added Eastmore High School, um, uh, as I said, uh, Independence and then South High School. And it was kind of funny how everything came back around because we were attending uh, one of the Linden games and then we found out uh, Commander Knight and Sergeant Hess were doing the pregame meals and we were all at a game together and it was just something that we just figured we can grow. That's something we can do next year for the rest of the teams. Um, help provide pregame meals and um, also at the girls programs you know uh, we did one girls program which was East Eastmore High School we had their girls program but we didn't have their boys and for the other programs we had the boys but we didn't have their girls so this year we're expanding and we're gonna do both uh, boys and girls team another neat thing about the girls program is we have a lot of um, athletes uh, female athletes on the department who will be running those camps so those camps will be uh, primarily ran by the female officers. So um, that's where we're going from, from here. We're looking to add a, a piece with the ABCs of policing and get a little classroom instruction as well with this program. Um, we're also looking to partner up on a community project with the kids and, and develop um, a, a partnership and a leadership type of uh, a program with that. So um, 
Uh, that's what I have about the basketball boot camps. Is there anything you want to add? No, I think you covered it all. Okay. I'm going to go back to show you the. Uh, yes, the, I apologize. I will try to get this uh, to you so you have the actual video. You can watch on your own on a CD or something. The, what they say on the video and the, and the uh, music is just fantastic. Uh, very well done. This is your uh, group. You want to mention anything about the, your officer's instructor? Oh, you want me to? Do yeah, yeah. That's fine. Okay, so um, the youth basketball camps, um, it was a thing that came up through, I think, Parks and Recs. Um, I actually went out to one when I was S14 a couple years ago. Um, and pretty much you just get involved with the youth that are there in the different rec centers, run some drills, um, and um, just kind of enjoy time with the kids. Let them know that you're there, you're there for them, uh, hold conversations with them. And uh, that's pretty much the gist. Um, we had a good time with it. I did, I did for myth, forget to mention at the conclusion of our camps, we have partnerships with uh, Chick-fil-A and Subway. So after the camps, we're able to sit down and have just candid conversation with the kids. And it's just amazing how kids open up when you have that commonality of sport and they're willing to talk about anything. You know, it, it really bridges that gap and then we're able to um, show a, a different side of us. Um, with the support of, of the officers at Linden, um, at the time we only had nine kids that showed up for that camp. And this year, all of them are willing, wanting to come. So it really takes a community, it takes a team effort to uh, create change. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, this last one's real quick, uh, Lieutenant Lip. Um, I wanted to introduce you to Lieutenant Jeff Lip. He is uh, the organizational accountability lieutenant that's just been assigned by the chief to be the liaison with the um, consultant for your group. So he will be working very closely with you and with the consultant on that. Um, Again, there's some video in here. We're not going to be able to play it uh, uh, because of that. However, it gives you just a, there's a, I'll just let him talk about it instead of playing the videos uh, in that case. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Good afternoon. And as, uh, as the Chief mentioned, I'm Jeff Lipp. I'm the lieutenant that was recently selected to work with the liaison that uh, was recently hired, I think, uh, Monday maybe, by the, uh, the city. So I look forward to um, starting that very important work and uh, getting to, new, to know all of you better. So I'm going to be speaking on a few topics, topics today. The first is Safe Routes to School. And this is a program that was designed to increase the number of families that can and do walk safely to and from school every day. And Columbus's Safe Routes to School program has humble beginnings. In 2013, a longtime Linden area resident, Mildred Sutphin Smith, was determined to take an active approach to cleaning up her neighborhood. So she started a neighborhood group called Linden Porch Parents. Mildred went door to door on her street, Myrtle Avenue, to recruit other neighbors to keep an eye on area children. Mildred's efforts were successful. She was able to recruit several neighbors to join her cause. The Linden Porch Parents decided that they would fly flags on their porches to signify when they were home, and this would indicate a safe place for children to go if they needed somewhere to feel safe. In 2016, Mildred was successful in expanding her program from 6 to, to uh, 35 members with the help of the North Linden Community Watch. And the Safe House to School program has since expanded, currently coordinated by Catherine Swidarski of Columbus Public Health. Safe Routes to School is now in 15 different neighborhoods, which are selected based on a few different criteria. Rate of violent crimes, and the volume of traffic crashes, and the existence, existence of adequate infrastructure in the area like sidewalks. Our community liaison officers work closely with Ms. Swidarski to coordinate CPD's involvements in events throughout the year, but we focus on two main events. One is the Walk and Roll, walk and roll to School Day, which is in October, and the Bike and Roll to School Day, which is in May. At these events, our offers, officers routinely engage in community relationship building by discussing bicycle and personal safety, participating in the biking and walking to and from school, and distributing stickers and temporary tattoos to children. The non-enforcement interactions associated with these events are important, especially for the young children in attendance, as these positive interactions can change perceptions and lead to more constructive interactions with police later in life. And I have a short video to show you that demonstrates uh, CPD's passion for participating in community engagement events like the Safe Routes to School program.
And I think it's not going to work. So let's see. I'd love to use. Okay, we'll cover that after the break. Okay. Uh, I'll turn it over to the chair. That's the end of the youth initiative. Thank you so much. This has been great. Don't go anywhere. We'll interact with you towards the uh, end of the day. Uh, I see it's 2.50. We're adjourned until 3 o'clock. Okay? Thank you. So I just wanted to share something because uh, it's something that I, mean, I really believe in, and I have seen it throughout several of these programs. And it's the importance of having one caring adult in the life of a child. So whether it's Explorers or the TAP program. So I wanted to share with you uh, an event that's coming up. So something to, hopefully you all know, the Columbus City Schools has an Office of Student Mentoring. I think this is going to be their third year. It's run by Keisha Huntley Jenkins. Steve Stevenson is one of the staff members, and there may only be three. Steve actually had led the, L, the Ward YMCA on the east side when they started uh, this, this program. Our former superintendent had as a goal that every child in Columbus City Schools would have a mentor. I know that they've started in the high schools. I think East maybe was the first one of some others. But on Saturday, August the 11th, from 3 to 5.30, there is an event at East High School. It is a celebrity basketball game. Now, it says that it will have NBA, overseas, and Columbus legends playing. Didn't give me any names, so I don't know who's actually playing. But the purpose is to recruit mentors for Columbus City Schools. So I'm just going to ask you to think about something. Come yourself and bring some friends. And especially for the officers, maybe not other officers, but your neighbors, church members, because I understand that they are getting some really excellent results in this one-on-one -on -one mentoring. They simply don't have enough of them. So it's Saturday, August the 11th, from 3 to 5.30, East High School. I'll be there taking attendance, okay? Now, Chief, all yours. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so now we're going to move on to the assignment uh, category. The Chief has uh, a significant number of assignments in the Division of Police that specifically focus on community outreach and engagement. So I'm going to start off with Sergeant Hess and Commander Knight on uh, Safe Streets uh, Project. Some of the technology issues have been corrected. Now we got the internet uh, working on the computer here. Sound worked on one but not the other, so we'll, we'll figure these out as we go. Okay, thank you, Chief. Again, I'm Commander Knight. I'm the commander of Zone 4, and this is uh, Sergeant Dana Hess, and I'm going to give you a very brief introduction about our Linden Safe Streets program. And then Sergeant Hess, who is running our team uh, with another sergeant, Sergeant Rich, is going to give you some of the details. If you haven't heard about the Safe Streets program, this was piloted under Chief Quinlan in the Linden area in 2017 with phenomenal results. Our goal was to re-engage the community, reduce violent crime, and kind of address some of these epicenters of crime that we're dealing with. And if you look at this right here, there's a lot of crime and criminal activity that we have to deal with in the Linden area. And it's been a real challenge for us because we didn't have the best community engagement in that area. We, we struggled getting tips for crime. We struggled with ind individuals who were witnesses reporting the information that they, we just struggled with our relationship and we were looking for a different approach to the problem solving. So we came up with this project which is community-based enforcement specific to the Linden area. We used uniformed bike officers and the foundation of engagement was designed basically to develop a relationship that we didn't really feel was strong enough to begin with. All of our enforcement projects were community driven so these officers were not taking dispatch runs, but they were going out there and engaging the community. And it starts, everything started with a police contact with a citizen. And then police go into the area a lot of times and say, okay, I know there's a drug house there, I know there's a problem over there, and they, they try to address those problems. 
We wanted to have the citizens direct our enforcement action. We wanted them to tell us what our priority should be for the Linden area. And we wanted to involve them in that enforcement action. So we became the front line to identifying all the service needs for the members of that community. So if there was a legal dumping, we were going to deal with that. If there was a problem with, um, you know, somebody that needed a house boarded up, there was a problem with a residence, we were going to take care of that. We were going to provide a first line to uh, city services across the board. And it was a visible, uniformed presence for both enforcement and problem solving in areas where we were seeing an increase in violence. And I will tell you, last year, this 10-person team on bikes in uniforms went in and we saw the violent crime in the Linden area that they were working reduced by 55%. And numbers don't lie. But it wasn't that that was the most impressive. It was the fact that the community at the end of the program said, we love this. We didn't hear that from our community in Linden before this. We want you guys back. Come back to our neighborhood. And the mayor provided us the resources this year to do it again in the Linden area with fantastic results and expand it to the Hilltop area and the south side on Parsons Avenue. And I'm going to turn this over to uh, Sergeant Hess here and she's running the program with Sergeant Rich and she's going to give you some of the details of what we're doing in the Linden area. As she comes up, what I want to show this slide to start off with, this is what the officers are encountering in Linden on, for the citizens, that they want this uh, eradicate from their neighborhood. At the same time, the same officers are finding a balance between the community engagement side, and that's what this will show. Good afternoon. So about 13 weeks ago, I started this program. And so we're in week 14 right now of 18 weeks. And 13 weeks ago, I would have said, I love Lyndon. And the ladies of the meetings that I attend on a weekly basis would have scolded me heavily. So I'm going to start off by saying I love North Linden, I love South Linden, I love Argyle Park, I love Brittany Hills. And if I missed one, I apologize. So I do love, I love all of Linden, though. It's been a wonderful uh, place to work. Now I'm going to start off by boring you with some statistics, because everybody loves to hear about statistics. And I'm going to tease you because I'm going to end my presentation with a few examples of why I'm drinking the Kool-Aid and why this program really, really works. So on our enforcement side, like Commander Knight said, it's broken into enforcement and community engagement. A few statistics from enforcement. We've seized $85,774 to date. We've seized 47 guns. We've made just an on-view felony arrest, 55. And just cocaine and crack, 213 grams of cocaine and crack have been seized off the streets. So those are some great enforcement numbers, right? But the one thing that's really been intriguing to me that I've seen a bigger positive impact in Linden is our community engagement side, which is the other component. Like, we, like Commander Knight said, everything that we do is driven from citizen contacts. So sources, people who call us and say, these are issues in our community. And the one consistent thing that we've learned about 75% of the, of the complaints that we get are quality of life issues. People are mad about the legal dumping, the junk vehicles, the parking violations, the vacant houses. So we're trying to make some really big changes uh, as far as that goes. So 84 events we've attended so far, which we're really, we're really proud of, and meetings. Um, we have been participating in a group called the Nuisance Abatement Group. Um, there are other nuisance abatement groups going on in the city. But in conjunction with uh, Katarina Carrick this, from the city attorney's office, Deborah Van Dyke from Code Enforcement, uh, Brian Valentine, he's the solid waste inspector, Marty Micah uh, from Land Bank, um, one, our, two of our CLOs, Alicia Zacker and Chris Riley, we come together once a week. We pick a street, and I know it doesn't sound like a lot. We go door to door. We hand out resource information to every single person who's home. We check for parking violations. We check for junk vehicles. We placard houses. We, uh, let, I'm trying to think of everything that we do. I don't want to miss anything. We look for illegal dumping. And we make a lot of positive police contacts. We hand out business cards. So that's something else that we've been working on. So far, we've placarded 29 houses in not that, not that much of a time. So I'm really pleased about that together. So the teaser, so how we tie it all together, why it's all working. So I've got a few stories for you. The first one, we had a phone call from a woman. 
She complained that there was a house on her street that was a drug house. So we start watching in. Our Safe Streets officers got some probable cause, then we got intact involved. And then we hit the house. We were able to get guns and drugs and make arrests out of this home. While we were there, we called code enforcement. We had them come out, they placarded the house. And then we also noticed that tons of the community were coming out. There were kids watching what we were doing. So guess what we did? We brought, we brought our stickers out and our suckers, and we started handing out stickers and suckers and letting the kids see all of Intax equipment so that they could play on it. And so how, how, what, what was so impressive to me was as we, we got done with this event, we went back to the office, we had a lot of paperwork to do, and I looked at our source sheet and the woman's name of who called it in originally, so we called her. And we said, hey, we just wanted you to know what we've done. And she said, I'm sitting on my front porch. And she said, praise Jesus, I can't believe you finally got something done about this. So it was such a positive way to connect all the dots together. And it took a giant team. It took Linen Safe Streets. It took Intech. It took code enforcement. It took all of us working together to resolve one issue. And I have a ton of stories, but I'm sure I'm going to go over my time if I keep going. So thank you so much for letting me present today. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, great success story there. Another assignment that we uh, work on is uh, I'm going to bring Lieutenant Lip back up for a bike patrol and campus walkie crew. Uh, tell you just a little bit about what they do. Again, the bikes are a great opportunity to engage the public without that barrier of a car or a paddy wagon stuff. It's just it's fantastic. Thank you, Chief. Hello again. And I'm going to do my best to stay right around five minutes, but it's going to be difficult to summarize concisely everything our bike units do in five minutes or less, but I'll do my best. So here in Columbus, we're fortunate enough to have the largest full-time deployment of bikes in the country with 120 officers and seven sergeants. And yes, you heard me correctly, the largest in the country. And to per per put our numbers in perspective, New York PD only has about 100, and they are primarily used only for large or special events. We are heavily invested in training our officers. We have 300 CPD officers currently trained on uh, basically how to ride a bike and how to do it effectively. Each of our bike officers undergo a rigorous 40-hour training program based on best practices in the, or in the industry. The 40-hour program consists of four rides of more than 10 miles at a 12 to 14 mile per hour pace. Participants must also pass a written test with a score of at least 70%. And they must pass a slow speed course. And I'm not 100% sure what this is, but I think it simply means you try not to fall off your bike while riding extremely slowly. Okay, and I, Commander over there is nodding her head, and I think that she recently uh, partook in that uh, exercise. In addition to the 40-hour base training, our officers attend two one-day bike rapid response team courses each year where our bike officers learn effective crowd management and control. We have experienced trainers that are experts in their field who have trained officers from all over the region, including Cincinnati, Dayton, Michigan, and Chicago. In 2016, our bike officers provided assistance to the Cleveland Police Department for the Republican National Convention. We sent 35 bike officers, which was the largest contingent of bike officers outside of Cleveland. Prior to assisting with the convention, our officers received specialized training on how, how to handle large protests and riotous situations. Our bike officers are routinely tasked with handling large-scale events and protests, whether protecting goal posts from being torn down at the horseshoe, or providing security for John Glenn's funeral procession, or protecting protesters who are expressing their First Amendment rights. Our bike officers are trained to use formations for, to protect infrastructure and citizens with minimal presence. Although our bike officers are a considerable, considerable asset when planning for events and protests, their primary responsibilities consist of patrolling their precincts throughout the year with very few exceptions based on inclement weather. 13 of our 20 precincts have dedicated bike units. and We also have five community response teams corresponding to each of our five patrol zones. We also have a campus walkie crew who patrol in the area just outside of campus. There are numerous benefits to having a robust bike program. 
One of the main reasons why we put an emphasis on bike officers is that they're approachable. Instead of sitting on their porch and watching an anonymous officer drive by in a cruiser, residents are much more likely to interact in a positive manner with their bike officers. They might wave and say hello, or stop us and engage us in conversation and tell us about a problem they're having up the street. Our bike officers offer versatility and mobility, which is another benefit. Whether it's navigating downtown streets or residential neighborhoods, bike officers can get to places cruisers can't. It makes them indispensable when it comes to addressing crime patterns or trends. One of our specialized bike units is the Campus Walkie Crew. And when I was asked to speak about this topic, I, I knew a little bit about the Campus Walkie Crew, but I wasn't as well versed as maybe I should be. So I reached out to the unit supervisor, Sergeant Steve Mason, and he was very helpful in providing information. He gave me example after example of what they did and how they impacted the lives of the people living and working in the off-campus area. As I was reading the material, one common theme stood out, and that's pride. It was evident that Sergeant Mason's officers felt really good about what they did on a daily basis. It wasn't just about riding around on a bike, taking reports, or writing open container tickets. What gives these officers the most satisfaction and what they are most passionate about is helping people. And that's one of the more common responses you'll get when you ask an officer, why did you take this job? Most of us took it because we want to help people. And as I was reading over the material provided by Sergeant Mason, it was clear to me that the 13 officers and one sergeant assigned to this unit had a significant positive impact on the lives of the people who live and work in the off-campus area. They routinely check businesses and bars and restaurants and speak to owners and employees, often knowing each other on a first-name basis. Sometimes the employees would even ask the officers how their family vacations went. And at these same restaurants and bars, the campus walkie crew officers are more than happy to provide escorts to young female students who don't feel comfortable, comfortable walking home alone in the dark. One of the unique aspects of our campus walkie crew is that they focus their efforts in the off-campus area just east of High Street, where they work with OSU police to provide services to around 50 to 60,000 students who attend the university from around the world. In addition to working closely with o the Ohio State University Police, the unit works with various student groups and participates in many school-sponsored events. One of the most significant uh, event that they participate in is coming up soon, and it's move-in week. And that sums it up for Campus Walkie Crew. As I've demonstrated, the, the Columbus Police D Department is one of the most well-respected and well-trained bike programs in the country. And our officers and supervisors associated with this program have and will continue to make significant contributions toward building a positive community and police relationship. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Lepp. I think the good takeaway there is this is an all-weather unit. doesn't matter. They're out year-round. We have mounted unit, motorcycles, bicycles. They all work year-round. That's unique to us. A lot of other agencies only are seasonal. Um, and we also integrate with OSU police and others. So there's a lot of uh, great benefits. When there's a protest going up High Street, we can't put cars alongside of them because there's no room. The bikes can shadow uh, the protesters and keep a barrier between the, the protesters and the motoring public so there's uh, safety involved while they're exercising their First Amendment rights. A lot of benefits to that. Uh, with that in mind, I want to bring up uh, Officers Klinger and uh, Officer Larry Geis uh, of our community liaison section, and they're going to discuss this program with you. I'm Officer uh, Scott Klinger, and I'm a bike guy. <laughs> the V twins. Anyway, you ought to see him in shorts. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to speak today. My name is Officer uh, Larry Geis. I'm going to go through a, this pretty quick. Uh, a lot of things have already been kind of discussed. I hate rehashing a lot of different things, so I'm going to be kind of quick on a couple of things. <clears throat> as far as the CLOs are concerned, when it boils down to it, I always look at it as the CLOs are the intermediate mediation between the police themselves and the community themselves. We're out in it on a daily basis, and 
always out talking to the different people. Our things is uh, to work with communities on issues and problems, being able to work more one-on-one -on -one with the community themselves versus sometimes the street officer that's, you know, unfortunately married from one run to the next run. You know, sometimes he doesn't always have that extra time to spend to be able to, say, to talk to someone. We're able to do that. Um, we deal with communities, we deal with businesses, uh, doing training for the safety of their employees, to active shooters, to even helping them with problems when they're talking about, uh, we have issues with people talking about uh, um, the homeless and things that come onto their property and cause problems for their businesses on their private property and we're able to do like agent trespass forms and those type of things to help officers to be able to help the business keep their businesses clean. <clears throat> we do schools, so we get into preschools, daycares, we do bicycle safeties, pedestrian safety, career days. Um, again, like I said, we did the block watches, we do civic groups. Um, we partnership with other city entities to work on complaints such as 311 complaints. Those type of things will uh, intermix with code, vice, narcotics, as just a handful of the groups, CRT, patrol officers themselves. Uh, we also very, work very hand in hand with the city uh, attorneys. They have each uh, city attorney, there's a city attorney attached to each zone itself. So with the five different zones throughout the city, we have one city, city attorney that's dedicated for our zone in particular. And um, it really works out well to be able to have that connection with the city's attorney's office to be able to work hand in hand with things. Um, our other things is big partnerships as far as businesses and as far as uh, partnerships with businesses like uh, the Lieutenant talked about earlier uh, with Target. We deal with uh, Northern Area Business Association, my, my uh, association, myself and Scott does, Northern Community Council, uh, different areas like that. Um, just kind of wrap up CLOs sometimes. Uh, my phrase is, you know, the jack of all trades, master of none. Sometimes we kind of feel like that because we do really do get diverse in a lot of different things we do. It's just a matter of keeping up, keeping up with it all. Um, the other thing we were asked to talk about real quick that I'm going to go through is our a nuisance abatement group. Myself and Officer Klinger, uh, with a lot of our area up there in the 161 corridor, uh, have a lot of the hotels up in that area that were plagued by prostitution, drugs. Um, the communities there were getting hammered with, you know, prostitutes in their neighborhoods or cars or homes and everything was getting broken into uh, to uh, feed people's habits. You had large groups like uh, such as the uh, Good Old Boys Car Club, the um, Quarter Horse Congress, places like that that used to come up and stay in those neighborhoods in those different hotels who started pulling out because of the issues around them. So basically we got identified the problem as far as with uh, community complaints, business complaints, and then we started looking into the calls for service throughout the neighborhood. We ended up working on partnerships with the city attorney, um, Bill Spralaza, by the way, that is our zone one attorney. Uh, does a great job for us. Code enforcement, Columbus Fire, State Fire Marshal, Building Department, Health Department, anyone that we could think of that could help us really work these problems and conditions and try to get them taken care of was a big help to us and it was big working with them. Um, we'd go from there once we got this group established and go out and actually inspect the properties. <clears throat> During inspecting these properties then we get into start looking at our enforcement actions, what we needed to do. Um, we would be able to contact like uh, narcotics, vice, those type of departments, be able to go out and work the areas, get prostitutions arrest, be able to catch people trying to sell drugs in the neighborhoods. You know, there's nothing like having a family come in from out of town, from out of state, and next thing you know, they've got the girl walks down the hallway and wants to proposition dad because she's working for a living and she's trying to find somebody else to help her make her business. You know, so that you got these families that stand in here and it's just making uh, very rough for anybody to even stay in those areas up there because of the kind of reputation it was getting. Um, we'd get, once we do the enforcement actions, then uh, myself and Officer Klinger would uh, make uh, notifications to the business owners themselves. So we would track down the owners of these properties and the owners, is, owners of the hotels, which we were finding these hotels are being run down and everything else was being owned by people that lived in $1.5 million homes but these hotels were just in absolute horrendous shape because the monies went and going back in the hotel. They just took whoever they wanted, left them stay there, and create the havoc for the neighborhoods. Um, 
We eventually went into additional enforcement actions and then eventually we'd go take them to court. Uh, so far, we've, with uh, anything that we've went after as far as going to court, uh, we have won every one of our cases. Um, also, all of them that have been turned around as far as looked at and been taken to, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> Brain doesn't work sometimes. Uh, anyway, what they would uh, appeal the case. So they appeal the case, and unfortunately, most of all their appeals have failed also because we made sure that things were in a, the ducks were in a row. Bill was very good at like putting things together, and it was taken care of. Um, so then a lot of things would come out. They'd have to follow, board them up for a year, or they'd have to come out, and the court would order certain mandatory things they would have to do. Um, this led us into our last partnership, which was, which was big, and it did, took a little bit of research trying to find something that worked for us throughout the country. Um, we ended up getting a partnership together with a city council, our city attorney, Department of Public Safety, um, our uh, Ohio Hotel Lodging Association. Not to mention anybody, but Director Speaks, sitting right there, was <laughs> part of the group. Yes. Who uh, wrote the law. Um, the Ohio Hotel Lodging Association, which was a huge partner for this to be put together, uh, the Columbus Chamber of Commerce and Experience Columbus. Uh, we managed uh, over a fair amount of time. It actually, it went pretty quick for the most part. The people came together, worked together on this to make it the right way to be good for everybody across the board. Um, we got an ordinance passed in 2015 and started being able to enforce it come 2016. Just to give you an idea on stats, nuisance abatement through uh, environmental, environmental courts where we've actually closed hotels, there was eight total. Um, we have, we've had seven times where we objected to people's licenses because now with the new licensing law we can go after them for their problems as far as drugs, prostitutes, and calls for service. Um, and then uh, last couple things is within uh, 500 feet, uh, we had it done 500 foot of, uh, we had a 52.5% drop in major crimes in 161 area corridor. And between 2012 and 2016, we had a 60% drop in calls for service in, on 161 itself. So in October of 2016, uh, Officer Geis and myself were invited uh, by the United States Attorney General to come down to Washington, D.C., and they flew us there uh, and asked us to join them at a ceremony to uh, give us an initial award. It was the Attorney General's Award for Distinguished Service in Community Policing, based upon our work in the uh, hotel area. Um, the Attorney General herself, Loretta Lynch, actually made the final choices, and uh, I believe the FBI vetted us, correct? Uh, it was a very nice thing, uh, a wonderful ceremony, and we really appreciated uh, being down there. Uh, we've also been recognized by Columbus City Council, Columbus Mayor, Crime Stoppers of Central Ohio, the Ohio House of Representatives, the Ohio Senate, the Ohio Crime Prevention Association, and the Ohio State University. And, and also, of course, our neighborhood groups. Uh, they, they loved it. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. I put them on the spot to talk about their uh, recognition that they've received. But I wanted you to see how much that this is a model nationwide that they're being, rep they're being recognized on the national level. Uh, and this is just two individuals. We have officers all over the division are doing the same uh, type of work. But that's just how uh, effective the model is. And uh, uh, on the right path. So uh, with that, I'm going to bring up uh, Officer LeVon Moorefield, who's going to talk to you about our community response teams. Thanks, Chief. Uh, like Chief said, I'm uh, Officer LeVon Moorefield. I'm a third shift uh, patrol officer. I've been on for about three and a half years now. So um, with that, I'm just going to talk to you guys a little bit about our uh, CRT team. CRT stands for Community Response Team. Um, we actually have four different teams, uh, one team per each uh, zone except for Zone 4. Uh, zone 4 does not have a dedicated um, community response team, but they do have Campy Walkus Crew, or I'm sorry, Campus Walkie Crew, 
um, and it sounds like Safe Streets, Linden Safe Streets, which is going to kind of take over there, uh, along with their evening men watch, who uh, kind of fills in for uh, their community response team. But um, our community response teams, they were initially started as temporary units under uh, federal funding. And uh, once the time frame for that funding ended, the units were kept by the division and uh, made into actual jobs. Um, I already went over the zones and things like that. Uh, SRB Bureau, that was actually, I don't even know what happened with that. that wasn't around when I got on, which was only three and a half years ago. So uh, with that, um, this full-time division uh, came right after SRB, as I was saying, and uh, when the unit switched to patrol, they broke into the four CRT units. Um, just some of the roles and responsibilities, they have a very big mission, very large mission. Um, CRT basically covers everything uh, that can't be done to, by patrol because patrol is tied up on dispatch runs and calls for service and things like that. Um, two things that investigative units don't have time to do. So um, they're pretty much commander driven. So they operate on each zone based on the current issues, projects and need. In addition to attending community events and or assisting with speaking to groups. Um, just some of the things that CRT is involved in are street level narcotics complaints and prostitution complaints, um, plain close surveillance, uh, creation and development of zone projects based on the need an area of the zone, um, just like different crime patterns and advisories, and you know, they'll tend to make these things a priority. Um, CRT responds to the 311 issues and complaints uh, called in by citizens. Um, they attend all community meetings and engagements and events. Um, as Lieutenant Lip was covering with the bike patrol, every CRT officer is bike trained and they do deploy on bikes uh, for different events, protests. Uh, I know that all of our CRT units attend the fair. Um, events like that, OSU football games, they are, they're all involved with those things. Um, they uh, assist CIU, which is our criminal intelligence unit, um, for de developing information on uh, group threats, which are usually gangs and things like that. Um, they uh, really don't respond to patrol, however, if there's a priority one or two uh, dispatch run that goes out, they will respond to those. Um, uh, and pretty much any other, they, they, one of the big things they do is any other specific issues and needs of the zone. So like quality of life issues, illegal dumping, that was something I did not know that our CRT uh, teams get involved with, but that is something that they do. Um, as far as the, uh, this is just a crime map up here, and obviously like uh, the different colors represent different crimes. Um, with that, like RC, like obviously you see uh, some of them have blue, I don't actually know what they stand for, but just a, uh, just an example, you know, the things that happen on zone one, some parts of zone one, those are not gonna happen on zone three and zone five and vice versa. Some of the violent crime that we get on zone three and zone five, that does not happen on zone one. So each, each team is different. It's not like it's, like they just have uh, specific, um, specific uh, things that they go after. With that, um, just let's just say like some of these blue dots or the light blue, the powder blue dots are uh, thefts and things like that. Um, and there's creating a, a, a crime pattern. Um, what our CRT officers will do is they'll, uh, you know, someone will go in plain clothes to uh, sur perform surveillance in these areas, just to try to uh, catch these thieves. Like a German village, I know it's a big area where people steal packages and things like that. We'll have plain cl clothes officers, CRT officers set up and perform surveillance in those areas based off of the crime pattern and the analyses and things like that to try to prevent that from happening, deter that from happening. Um, some of the robberies, the uh, burglaries, things like that, based on the crime patterns, um, they'll set up there and uh, what they're able to do because they don't have to respond to calls for service, they're able to work on back channels, work together as a team to try to prevent these things, deter them, catch these criminals in the act. Whereas patrol officers like myself, you know, I'm usually tied up on dispatch runs, taking reports, accidents, uh, you know, taking the report for the burglaries, things like that, where I can't always uh, try to set up and perform surveillance, things like that. So. Um, this is just what a, snap, a snapshot of what our CRT teams do. I mean, we'd be here much longer than seven if I try to, in, you know, incorporate everything that they do. Um, and you know, this is no way all-encompassing, but um, with that, um, the, uh, they're, they're a very, you know, valuable resource within our division because um, they're able to do things that, like I said, the normal patrol officers like myself can't do. So, thanks, Steve. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Officer Moorfield. I think the, you know, a lot of the common term is putting cops on dots, these are all crimes, and we figured out a way to keep balance that demand for community engagement with the fact we're still responding to over a million calls for you know crimes in progress and, and other needs for police service a year. 
and these community response teams are able to strike that balance where when there's a specific pattern going on we can focus on that and they can still spend time engaging the community and respond to their needs not just necessarily what uh, we want done but what the community is demanding. So with that in mind I'm going to bring up Officer Jennifer Mancini. Uh, she's going to talk about our uh, crisis intervention team. I'm going to see if this video will play. I don't know that it will but since the internet seems to be working we'll see if the sound comes through. If not, we'll just cancel it. Is there any way to turn that up? Okay, uh, I'm just going to scan through this just real quick so you can kind of get a little bit of a picture. You got officers in classrooms and they do scenarios and, and they're engaged in uh, how to interact with uh, mental uh, uh, health on the street and how to try to gain compliance. So that's kind of what that's about. And so with that, I'll uh, let uh, Officer Mancini kind of talk about our program real quick. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to discuss today two programs that Columbus Police has partnered with other agencies to go back into the community in relation to mental health and also addiction because we've learned that with people with mental health sometimes use substances to kind of mask the, um, the illness that they're going through. So I thought it was important to kind of show maybe some numbers first. Um, I collect data for the CIT program and I read every aid and transport report and we did this from April 1st to June 30th. And we had 5,763 5, runs from April 1st to June 30th, dealing with mental health, whether it's a suicide attempt, somebody in a crisis, addiction, overdoses, and that's a lot of numbers. That's a lot of runs for three months. And in those runs, 2,700 officers were CIT trained that responded to those runs. Out of those runs, we transport people a lot. We transport them to net care, we transport them to hospitals, the individuals that are in crisis. And the ones that we don't transport, they're the ones that have been, we say, like, we didn't transport, we left them behind. So what we've done now is Columbus Police has a co-responder team that has partnered with NetCare. NetCare hired four clinicians, and four officers have left their positions for six months right now and have partnered with a clinician who rides with them every single day. These officers take the runs that come in on the board, the mental health calls for service, which helps us that are on patrol, like myself, who is maybe stuck on a run, but I'm CIT trained, but I can't break away and take that run that might need a CIT officer. This also allows the clinicians to maybe link the client at that moment to their caseworker or their provider, such as like North Central or Southeast, so they can get services right away and link them back up to whom they're responsible to. Another team that we work with is the REACT team. So this is one of my passions as well as the CIT program. REACT has partnered up with Columbus Fire. So we as the uh, CIT officer, we ride around with fire. We're in plain clothes. CFD is in their uniform because everybody likes fire. So they like to knock on the door and be like, fire department, and I'm like standing next to them like, Columbus police. So we go out with them and we respond back to the individuals, the individuals who have overdosed, have been Narcaned, but refuse to go with the squad to a hospital or refuse to go to Mary Haven, which has now opened up a facility on High Street for the Stabilization Center. We go back to those calls for service to where the person actually was given the Narcan. A lot of times we're finding out that the place that we go back to is either a vacant structure, it could be an alley, but there have been times that I've gone into people's homes and they're so shocked that the, we've come back with the fire department and ourselves and said, hey, we, we know you were given Narcan, we want to take you somewhere to get treatment, would you be willing to come with us, we can get you in the door right now. There's no wait, there's a bed waiting for you, and let's get this going. Some have come and some have said, I'm not ready yet, because it takes time to want to make that change. 
So these two programs that CPD is involved with is crucial to the community. To be able to get somebody linked quickly that's in a mental crisis or to get somebody to a facility that can put them into a detox program and then into the residential side of Mary Haven without that wait of, I need to call every day and I'm waiting for a bed, I'm waiting for a bed, because they're not gonna wait for the bed. They give it maybe a day or two and they're done with that. So Mary Haven's opened up that facility on High Street and CPD is very involved in that as well. So these are the two components that I'm very proud to be involved with and I'm honored to be here today to share that with you. We have 370 CIT officers right now, and then they have a class, I think it's next week starting Monday, and all of high school resource are gonna be taking that CIT class. Because I, as we know, like, it's very important that starting at the young age in the high schools, they're coming in contact with individuals and the children that are also suffering from a mental illness that may not have been diagnosed yet. And so them receiving the training, because we, we look for signs and symptoms. And once we can understand what the illness is, it helps us to communicate better when we know what they're kind of going through in a sense of like, say, schizophrenia, when they kind of keep looking behind them because they're hearing voices. Before we were trained on what schizophrenia was, we didn't even know those were some of the signs and symptoms of that. And we were just thinking they weren't listening to us, they were turning their heads, but they weren't. They were just hearing somebody else talking to them. So, Understanding the illness and then learning how to communicate and de-escalate situations is crucial to being successful out there. And working on the radio, the radio knows who to send? Yeah, CIT. So when I walk in my service, like I'm 114 and I'm coaching Dana right now, so I uh, always walk in like, if you have a shotgun, you walk in shotgun, Narcan, and CIT. So they know I'm the CIT officer. So if an if a individual calls in, they know they can request CIT. And they request us a lot, but like I said, sometimes we're not available. So having the, uh, the four units with a clinician on board has really helped out a lot to um, salvage those kind of runs where a CIT officer cannot make it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you having me. Okay, Officer Fuqua is gonna come up and talk about um, the diversity and inclusion officers. Thanks, Chief. All right, I am like Commander Knight. I have a hard time standing behind a podium. I can't stand still very well because a recent study just came out that humans and adults specifically, the attention span is like 12 seconds. So I think mine's like nine, so I promise I'll be quick. Uh, before I get into uh, my role as a diversity inclusion liaison, I would like to backtrack just for a second and acknowledge uh, Dr. Jones and uh, Director Stewart for uh, their involvement in the TAPS program. Uh, I'm also involved in that, very passionate about that. And the thing about that, that program that, that hits home for me personally is if I had that opportunity to engage with officers at that young age, maybe I would have had a different perception of law enforcement prior to having this job. So one of the biggest things that I've learned since we've been doing this is that the effect that it actually has on young people because most of the contacts they have with police are always negative. So this is the first time in their life they've actually been introduced to police in a positive manner and that goes a long way. So again, I can't thank Director Stewart and Dr. Jones enough for starting that program and having the ability to fight to keep the program going as far as the funding. It's still funny calling him Director Stewart. Uh, he trained most of us in this room when he was a training sergeant you know, with CPD, so he still makes me a little nervous every time I, I look at him, so, but it's cool. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, I digress. So, really quickly, the diversity inclusion liaison section is really simple. My job, my primary job is a second shift patrol supervisor on 13 Precinct, which encompasses the south end of Columbus, basically Parsons Avenue, all the way down to the, the Racino on High Street. So we have a pretty big area. The chief decided in February 2015 that it was a good idea to implement an officer from each one of these uh, communities who have traditionally or stereotypically not been close with law enforcement. So it was important to her that she had a representative for each one of these communities represent each, each group. So uh, my primary role is obviously the African-American community and some of the things that I do 
can be something as simple as, you've heard it a lot, quality of life issues, right? So a lot of people think that I get a lot of calls regarding to, or regarding, you know, someone's a racist or it's always negative. A lot of times it's just quality of life issues that's something they may not understand. Well, I feel like my son is being stopped because he's a young African American in this neighborhood. And a lot of times, the biggest issue with police in general that I always tell people is we can do a better job of communicating with the public. So in other words, I will take a lot of calls where I'm just simply explaining to citizens why the police do some of the things that we do. And once I talk to them and they, they understand why we do what we did to that particular youth or an adult, that usually solves the issue. It's just a matter of communication. So that's really our primary function in our role in the diversity inclusion liaison section is just to bridge that gap in those communities. Uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, I know, personal stories from each section, like for example, Lieutenant Nick Convis is the liaison to uh, the LGBTQ community. And one of the things that we were able to do, uh, this was a while ago, but it was one of the hate crimes, like the, the hate crime charge had been on the books for a while, but it never actually had been used in Columbus. And he has been able to use that charge and we've been able to successfully charge people under hate crimes, something that we have never actually been able to do here, you know, at least in my 13 years, to my knowledge. So um, not only do we deal with, again, quality of life issues, but, you know, there's also criminal things as well where people feel like they may have been uh, mistreated by uh, the police or certain people within their own community. Uh, I deal a lot, actually, with people who can't understand why you know, someone from their own community, specifically in a black neighborhood, that crimes are being committed, you know, black on black crime, for lack of better words. So, you know, I do a, a, a lot in the communities of trying to bridge that and trying to fix what the solutions or fix the problems and come up with a solution to help deal with that in the future. So uh, that's a little bit about what we do. Like I said, I wanted to be brief so we can keep it moving. So I'm sure at the end there'll be more questions because my job seems to generate more questions than uh, anything else. Oh yeah, so let's see, that picture was, uh, oh, at our, uh, the Chris Center, which is a community refugee immigration services, we do a lot of work with them. So a lot of new Americans, when they come to the country and specifically to Columbus, you know, this, this agency helps them find jobs, find housing, how to communicate. And we do orientations almost weekly on educating people how to interact with the police if you're ever stopped in a car or out on the street. And we also help them deal with uh, the transition with neighbors and how to interact with American culture as it relates to their culture because there are certain things that they're not aware of that, you know, potentially could cause problems with neighbors. So we do a lot of that as well. Thank you. So I think the big takeaway that you're starting to notice is there's really no segment of the population that we are overlooking or not trying to tailor some type of outreach to. Uh, I think that's a, a good opportunity to, to look at that way. We also do things with uh, mutual aid agreements with uh, Joint Patrol OSU. When I was uh, had an opportunity to get out to D.C. On, on, for the Major City Chiefs with a captain from Ohio State University, and while we're down there, we're looking at how do major universities work inside major metropolitan areas. And uh, Captain Dave Rose and I came up with the idea of doing this joint patrol, and it made this national publication. So obviously we wanted to start it here because we were the ones that got it into the national publication. So we started a joint patrol, OSU officers uh, and Columbus officers work in tandem together, uh, east of High Street, over on the campus, and, and that's pretty, uh, uh, it's been working very well and it has a different way of approaching students again multicultural students uh, the um, there he is uh, officer Mike Cameron's going to come up and tell you just briefly about the mounting unit I don't have a slide up here for the mounting unit because they have been featured in almost every slide we've been presenting because they are so engaged in the community and what they do so officer Mike Cameron good afternoon as the chief said, it is a privilege to serve on the mounted unit. We are involved in all the major events that happen uh, around the city. Um, your mounted unit is one of two full-time mounted units in the state of Ohio. Uh, we are the only full-time mounted unit that is solely supported by the division in the city. Uh, Cleveland is the other mounted unit. Uh, the city of Cleveland provides the personnel, but actually a private partnership was formed 
to get them the equipment, uh, the animals, the facility, uh, even the hay and uh, the feed uh, to maintain. So we are very unique. Uh, we are all year round, um, all weather. Um, like I said, we, re we report to all the major events, just, and I'm not gonna kill you with stats, but 2016, uh, the unit did uh, 205 events. Last year was uh, 278. That's spread out amongst six officers and one sergeant. That doesn't take into account the large uh, protests that we saw years back and that we respond to. What isn't documented and what is probably the most important to us is the patrol hours. When we pick a neighborhood or we have an opportunity to go out and go into an area where we're not typically and just get in and out and amongst the community and the people that come out of their houses just to come out and see the horses, it is the ultimate icebreaker. We start a dialogue. They come out because they want to see the animals, but then we get a chance to talk to them. And it inevitably comes up, problems in the area, you know, things that they've encountered, things that we could help them with, uh, and generally uh, walk away with a real positive encounter. I wish there was a way to put a stat to that. Um, I know that, that, uh, that this is a big part of what uh, the committee is about, um, and there's just really no way to do it other than invite you out to shadow us. Uh, or come talk to us or stand next to us at, an, at a large event and see the interaction and listen to what's being talked about. Uh, listen to the type of questions we get. It's not all about the animals. Most of it is. And it's not just kids. Um, we always tell them that the, uh, the horses are for big kids too and we'll get a large amount of adults um, that will come in and we'll get involved in the same type of conversations. Good, thank you. Um, Everyone's here familiar with the ride along program. I'm going to try to play this recruiting video. I don't think the sound's going to work, but you'll at least see the subtitles and get a little idea of, of what the uh, uh, rep video, if it's going to play. You can sort of hear it somewhere. Just to give you that real quick, we've got our star in the room. Um, the last piece is communication is going to go really quick. Uh, we're going to, uh, just three tiny components to it. We're going to talk to, uh, with Officer Tracy Bowling about our annual report, again, how we are transparent with our community. Officer Tracy Bowling. Good afternoon. I'm Officer Tracy Bowling, Columbus Division Police. Been there about almost 30 years and I've been helping with the annual report for about the last 20 years. 
Um, the annual report, I, I, there's a copy in each of your t uh, seats. Um, it provides, the, it's a chance for the division to show the public all of our activities and statistics for the previous year. Um, to be fully transparent, we try and show 10 years worth of statistics, if at all possible, for like crimes, so we can show they're trending up, down. We, and, and within the, the body of the newsletter or the publication, we try and show um, what we're doing to, to combat that. In addition to all of this, um, for the 27 report, we have focused on community engagement. M m many of the things that we've talked about today, all of those things will be included, are included in the annual report. All the different programs, what's worked, what hasn't worked. Because um, some of these officers, they're doing stuff on duty and off duty. The media doesn't know about this. Nobody knows about it. The only way we can push it out is for us to tell it and put it in the end report. Um, the reason you've got the 2016 annual report, this is, you saw this picture earlier. Um, this, is, this is the 2017 version. It is currently at the print shop. It will be ready on Friday. I intend to have copies for WG Quinlan for 20 copies or whatever. And for the next meeting, you guys will have copies of, of all the new, the new publication. Um, in addition to that, I'm going to have the Public Information Unit put out a thing on social media about that the, the publication is also available on the website. The community can go on there and click on there. They can see what the officers are doing. They can see what they're doing in their neighborhoods. And if they've got questions or concerns, they can call us and we'll, take, we'll, we'll answer whatever we can. Anything else? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. This uh, report will not be done without uh, her expertise. Thank you. Uh, Officer, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Denise Alex Bazunas is going to talk to you about our uh, media programs, our social media, and some media training days we do. And we've got like two more little tiny things to talk about. We're done. I'll be quick. He just whispered to hurry up. So I wanted to let you know. Um, I run our social media. I joined the division about four years ago from the other side, um, actually being a reporter. Um, our Facebook followers, we have almost 110,000 followers. Four years ago, we had under 8,000, so um, we're doing awesome with that. Twitter, 34,000, and we just started Instagram a couple months ago, and we've got about 2,000 followers. Some of the things that we do on Facebook, and first off, does anyone follow us on Columbus Police Facebook or social media? Raise your hand. If you don't, you need to. Um, we're solving a lot of crime. In the age of body cams, um, surveillance video, we are identifying suspects left and right. We are having moms, dads, brothers, sisters, neighbors turning people in. Um, we actually had a mugshot of one person not too long ago. It went uh, national, and you might have seen this one. It was in a barricade situation. He's actually commented on our social media page and, and used his mugshot as his Facebook profile. Um, <laughs> So we see all sorts of things. Um, we're solving crimes, we're educating people. We, we have a little segment sometimes that we put, did you know? And I just put one up with Officer Mancini about our CIT officers. A lot of people don't even know that we have CIT training. So we are constantly educating. We are, of course, trying to use humor as much as we can because it is such a serious profession. So we, we try to lighten things up. Our community liaison officers send us pictures all the time. Our mounted unit, our canine. Um, our recruiting unit, everyone's doing an amazing job and I feel like now more than ever we have to use social media to let people know that officers are human. We are doing good things in the community. It's not just about making arrests um, and enforcing the law. It's about having fun too, playing basketball, making relationships and, and that sort of thing. We also put out a lot of employment opportunities. Um, I, I think with recruiting's help, with, with the videos, with getting messages out on social media, we're getting a more diverse group of people wanting to join Columbus Police. Um, and, and joining the Explorers, starting at a younger age as well. National Night Out, uh, recruiting, our Red, White, and Boom video, just some of the efforts that we do in our public relations unit. It's me and a sergeant who run the unit, and I used to sit, think of it as myself being kind of the proactive person because police officers don't like to toot their horn, so I try to do it for them. And then the reactive, of course, is sometimes, you know what, hits the fan, and, and we have to talk about what we do, why we did it. Um, sometimes it's not pretty, but we, we try to be as transparent as possible. I also want to let you all know that there is a difference between public information and public records. So if people want a police report, if they want a 911 call, 
it doesn't go through us. It'll go through our public records unit. So um, we've gotten a few calls. I don't know if you've ever heard of Stormy Daniels. A lot of people have been asking us about that. They have to go to public records, you know, to, to get those uh, public records when they become available. Uh, police involved shootings is another um, thing that we, we do respond to. So any police involved shooting, either myself or usually the sergeant will go out to that um, police involved shooting. We'll talk with officers there. Uh, we'll give a media statement. We'll put out a release. And then within 24 hours, we identify the officer. So we wait 24 hours to give the officer's families enough time to understand it was them who was involved to talk with the officer before the media puts it out there. Let me think, we also do media training days. So once a year, we do try to educate the media. We try to bring them into the police academy. We do scenarios with them. Um, what would you do if a, someone put a gun to your face? You know, do you shoot them automatically? Do you talk to them? So we've been trying to do that. It used to be an eight hour day, but with the media staff so small, um, they haven't been able to do that as much. So we are going to their TV stations, you know, making it maybe a shorter day, but continually trying to educate them because there is a high turnover of, of reporters and staff. I think the last thing I kind of want to just say is there was a case in January, and, and maybe a lot of you saw it. It, it, it went viral. There was a picture of an officer who had a gun behind his back. Uh, he happened to be a white officer and had a gun behind his back, and he was talking to an African-American man who was sitting down. And someone had put out on social media that it looked like the officer was about to shoot him. And it took off. It went viral. And it was on a Sunday, and I think I communicated with Chief Quinlan. You know, we, we wanted to put out a, a facts matter. So we put out... This is what happened, this is what's going on, instead of just ignoring it or letting it you know, spread swings and fly away. And, and we put a kibosh to that. I mean, it was that quick. So we're not sitting back anymore and, and waiting for you know, us to get beat up. If we get beat up, okay, but if we have a reason for what we do, why we do, we're putting it out there as soon as possible. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask, but I encourage you all to follow us. Yeah, no questions, sorry. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so last two things, we're putting out a, a new uh, mobile platform uh, with all of our social media and everything on a uh, uh, community engagement app. And the last thing I want to end with is what you need to take away from everything that's been presented here today. This is division wide. This is from the chief all the way down to the recruit officers involved in community engagement. It involves the director's office, the mayor's office, the city attorney's office. Everybody's involved in this at, within the public safety division. It's sustained. This has been going on for years. We've been able to demonstrate that. It focuses on all neighborhoods, all ages. So we're inclusive of everyone that we reach out to. It's documented, and you can verify what we say we did. I presented that report to you, and it's genuine. This isn't something we do just because we have to. This is who we are. This is our culture. Uh, with that said, uh, that concludes my time, and I appreciate the few extra minutes uh, you provided me, and thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so the chief has managed to get me off of my goal, and, and yes, I said that, but I do appreciate everything that we heard. I, I don't say I pride myself, but I just think because of my particular background, I should know maybe more than what I do, because today I have learned so much uh, about what our entire division does beyond what I thought that they did. And it was very, 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 very informative. And so I also apologize to you if I cut some of you off in terms of your time. Uh, I was looking through the annual report. It really seems to me that almost everything is actually in there in terms of what we talked about. Um, but there's some really uh, great things you know, going on and I uh, certainly appreciate that. So what we're gonna do now, and, and it's whether there are questions or comments or you want some further information, we're almost going to treat it like our uh, uh, tabletop conversations. I mean, I'll try to um, uh, monitor here, but if you've got some specific questions about a program that you heard about, if you want to ask, well, why isn't there something else that maybe you think you know, we should be doing, and we will engage, even though they're, they're not sitting here at the table with us, everyone in the room is a part of this conversation. Yes, I've made another decision. We're not going to have a, a break. Uh, if, if, so, <laughs> if you must leave for whatever purpose, please do that. But that will give us 10 minutes back, and I'm still going to try to do, finish this by 4.30, 4.45. Okay? Go for it. All right, so since everybody's being shy, I'm going to dive right in. Um, <clears throat> I'm interested in the TAPS program, and so I'm going to kind of direct this to 
uh, officers over there as well as uh, Doc here. Um, the, what type of follow-up is done with these young people once they complete the TAPS program? And then what types of relationships are developed out of those and, and how do you guys follow up on those? All right, so one of the things I forgot to mention in the interest of time was um, we had a situation where, again, uh, the very, one of the very first places we did TAPS was at East High School. And traditionally, the relationship between police and students of East High School, just not good, just very simply. So uh, I had a particular young man in my group. So after the program was over, and this is gonna kind of lead into your question. So after the program was over, at this particular time, we had no type of follow-up, no resources, nothing beyond that. It was just once you graduate, you know, we're gone, they're gone, going about your leisure. So this was almost a year later. I saw this, well, actually, I, let me backtrack. A year later, I'm driving down the street in the cruiser. He sees me, and he flags me down. And he's like, hey, how you been, you know? And he was one of our more difficult students that we talked about in the beginning who didn't want to be there. So anyway, long story short, he commences to tell me about a homicide that had occurred. And he said he had known this information for a long, long time, but he did not feel comfortable talking to other officers. And the whole point of the story is, even though we had bridged that gap between us and him, he wasn't completely comfortable yet just telling any officer, but once he saw me, he gave me this information, which in turn led to the capture of the person who committed the homicide. So the, the power of the program is proof right there that a young man was willing to come forward and give information on a homicide that he otherwise would have never given based on being in TAPS. Now to answer your question in terms of the follow-up and what we do, that is one of the challenges that we're still working through to make better. So one of the things that we did this year, uh, myself and a few other th of the other officers, after the program was completed, we continually followed up at the school afterwards. And what we found was after the curriculum and after they had graduated, just our mere presence by showing up to them and seeing them, they, they realized how much we cared. So we got so much more information out of them just in general about their life and feeling comfortable. And we even had a few that are actually interested in becoming a police explorer, which you know I forwarded that information to the recruiting unit. But uh, we're still working on the, uh, the technical parts of the, the follow-up. That's one of the challenges we're still dealing with. But that was quite effective this year for the first time, actually having officers follow up with the kids after the program was over and more of an unstructured environment, if that makes sense. I think I covered all that. Was there another part of that question that I missed? That was it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Judge, you need to speak up. You need to speak into the microphone. Surprised at the great volume of community outreach that we do in all the various programs. So, you know, 3,800 events last year alone. But there's another side. Um, and as managers, you also have to be cognizant that. We were receiving 1.2 million calls a year for service, 650,000 responses of, uh, of events. So we always have to be careful to balance. Um, it is wonderful, for example, to spend time with a 95-year-old uh, uh, resident and to take that time with her. But I'm sure if those of you who have gone on the police ride-alongs, I'm sure that you saw that the runs get stacked, especially uh, certain hours, certain days. And time spent with one person can offset an emergency response, uh, the, the time needed for that. But my point being, we are constantly trying to balance the two with the community engagement versus a rapid response to an emergency. It's delicate. Other questions from the commissioners? For the uh, Police Explorers program, um, are there kind of eligibility rules um, and then are there fees associated with it? Kind of what sorts of things go along with a youth who wants to get involved? Can I just answer right here? Uh, okay. So, um, uh, 
the Explorers program is new to the new expanded recruiting unit. Um, I have uh, officers uh, Jason Jackson and Joel Westbrook. Um, they both uh, have been in and out uh, just because of different uh, um, leave situations, medical and such. Um, I'm learning about that. There are fees attached to it. Um, they pay dues um, and then there is a vetting process. Um, we allow everybody to come in because they're youth. Youth is going to be youth. And we, um, uh, Officer Tucker explained the entire process of how it, how it goes from youth to officer. Um, but it, it is, it's an old program, but it's a new program as well. So um, there are fees, there are, you know, rules, there's regs, there's, um, and a lot of learning. So when there's hands-on um, scenarios, um, we go through a lot of things and they lead up to great events. Um, he spoke a little bit about the different competitions. I was fortunate enough to uh, participate and, and view uh, the Heart of Ohio this year. They took home a lot of medals and trophies based on the different type of training scenarios that they had been in because um, they compete against all kind of other exploring units across the the state for Art of Ohio, and then the NALIK Conference, which is like the National Law Enforcement Exploring Competition. This year was held in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, which West Lafayette, Indiana, which is Purdue University. Um, they did really well there as well. Um, and that one was a, um, a worldwide competition. So they're going up against the large uh, New York cities, the Homeland Securities, and all of those things. So um, it's a very beneficial program. But I think I think I did answer your question, but there are a lot of a lot of things attached to it. Well, and the reason I asked. Yeah, oh sorry. Okay, yeah, and sorry the reason that. why I ask is because if it is a good potential source for kind of a feeder program, are there barriers that would stop youth who come from an under resourced community from being able to engage that way? So is the fee high high enough that it keeps some youth from being able to participate? That's not coming through and uh, or that a, um, a program in Linden where we're going to take it to a, a neighborhood so those who don't have parents that can get them out to the training academy uh, we're going to maybe try to go to them and, and provide a program uh, in their neighborhood to allow for that and with fundraising to offset some of those fees it's like 400 and some dollars to go to a, a, a nationwide competition um, just for registration fees and when we send them to flagstaff arizona uh, albuquerque new mexico uh, we send them around different you know out west uh, there's a, a lot of fundraising needs to go on to afford that I was talking with uh, Officer Jackson when he was here about his experience. And one of the things I'd share I, I, uh, is that many times the young people who come into the program come with significant um, academic deficits. And so, for example, as he said, not being able to, you know, to literally to write. And what I think this program will do will also, uh, maybe it wasn't designed this way, but you've got to figure out who can tutor you know, the kids and to get them to where they need to be. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, in the years that I've been here is that many times I've found that one program may not align with another. So for example, if you're going into London and if there's a strong mentoring program through Columbus City, it might really make sense to try to reach out to the gentleman that I just mentioned, Steve Stevenson, to see if you can't get some of those students who are already being mentored and tutored into the program. So many times we kind of silo ourselves. It's, it's just something that happens because you may not even know what's going on you know, somewhere else, but that would really, really, I think, give those students uh, a leg up in terms of their being to successfully participate in the Explorers program. Yes? So the Explorers program, and you have the use of the the youth who may not be um, old enough to go through the civil service right through, do you have any data on those youth that successfully complete that program, what they do, where they go after that? I don't know that we have a long-term uh, uh, review of, of what the, off or what the uh, cadets have uh, gone on to progress in their adult life, uh, but we you know, do have 
contact with them through 20 years old, those who want to stay in the program. What we see a lot of them do at 18, 17, 18 is join the military when they get out of high school. And our hope is that they have a good enough experience with us when they return from the military, they come seek uh, full-time employment as a police officer then. We also, through the training, can pro help prepare them to take the civil service test. So it's not a one-shot where you come out for a study session, uh, maybe get a, a you know, police applicant study session and get some information about it. We can train them every week and kind of prepare them so by the time they're old enough to take the test, it's kind of, uh, you know, very second nature to them. Yes, Jason. I have two questions. Um, I do thank you for the, uh, this annual report. Um, I guess I'm looking at the organizational overview. I know this is from uh, 2016. Um, I'm just wondering, has any uh, diversity been added to this group um, right here since 2016? Um, currently, there's been uh, no promotions uh, to the, um, the last uh, commander that would not be in there. It was promoted was a male white. And um, so for our uh, organizational rank structure, uh, the component, the makeup is, is what you see there. That's why I mentioned earlier that uh, this is also a mentoring opportunity for me to have a lot of different individuals through here come in and speak to a group like this and develop that ability to, to come in and address community groups uh, at this platform level of, of the Mayor's Commission and uh, hopefully progress through the ranks. So we're trying to develop that. So our recruiting platform, our 10-year strategic plan includes um, not only a pipeline program for, for kids, but it also includes a mentoring idea of what we're wanting to develop people through the ranks, not just into the police department, but increase the diversity through the ranks. That, that would be good. I, I know I've heard it said and talked about trying to increase diversity on the force, and I, I just, I personally think that um, having diversity in the organizational hierarchy would help that. Uh, my second question um, is actually for, and I'm glad to see um, that there's several officers here. Uh, so this question is kind of just for just all of the officers here, excuse me. And so I know for me, uh, being on this commission, um, I know some of us have, have concerns. And um, I know, I guess, and I just speak for myself, uh, when I come to these meetings, um, and some of the information I've, I've heard before, I've been in, in some of the presentations, it, it's good, but I, I feel like it's just, um, it, it's continually building, I guess, the case um, that uh, the Con Columbus Division of Police um, is, is cutting edge, it's, it's, it's top notch, um, you, and that's all well and fine. Um, I guess what I would like to hear from the police uh, officers here in this room is what what are your expectations or what would you like to see come out of this commission? Because I, I know I have concerns, I know others have concerns, things that we would like to see, but what, what, are, what are some of your expectations? What would you like to see come out of this commission? I'll briefly speak for the group, if I, if I may. Um, Actually, I think we want to hear from the street officers, if we have, have such. I don't mean to cut you off, but I think they're not saying give command. And so <laughs> we're, we're talking about you know, I think that was a great question, but again, we want to hear from the officers. That's a great question. So anybody that knows me knows I always have an opinion and I have no problem offering it, right? So all the things you brought up, very fair points, very important. One of the things that I want to double back on in terms of the rank structure that you see on that page, uh, obviously that takes, um, anytime you go to a different rank from officer to sergeant all the way up to chief, requires a promotional exam. And in a lot of cases, some officers or sergeants, for example, like me, the lieutenant test is coming up very soon to give me the opportunity to move up in the ranks. However, on a personal note, for me, I have been on second and third shift for 14 years. Well, it'll be 14 years in December, right? So it's important for me to move up the ranks because the higher you go, the more effect you can have. However, I'm married with two kids and my kids are at the age where they need me. So I'm at the point in my life right now where going up is not the best thing for my family life. So I'm choosing to stay at the sergeant rank, number one, because I enjoy my job, what I'm doing. Number two, 
my family life, it's more important that I'm really close to going to daylight, like first shift hours. So a lot of times you don't see as much diversity, not necessarily defending anything, but we all have personal things in our lives that are preventing us from wanting to go higher. So it's not necessarily, the perception sometimes is like, oh, well, Columbus Division of Police is racist or they don't want people to succeed of color. No, a lot of times it just comes down to we all have personal things in our lives, like he's a recruiting sergeant. That's a pretty great gig. And if he got promoted to lieutenant, guess what? He gets booted out of that and has to go back to patrol, which I'm sure he doesn't want to do right now. So just to answer that a little bit, sometimes the public really doesn't understand like how the rank structure works and why certain people are in the positions that they're in. Now, the most important thing from your council, right? So I'll be blunt and be honest. When it was first created within the ranks, there were a lot of people who were upset because they did not understand personally why the mayor would create a council because a lot of people felt like there wasn't a problem within the division of police specifically. Now let's all be real here and understand that that's completely false. No police department in the United States of America or in the world is perfect, okay? We all have our flaws. You know, we, I consider us much better than most departments, especially with the size that we have, but I think we do a pretty phenomenal job, but we still have a lot of work to do as well. Now, from what I've heard consistently from the people amongst the lower ranks in the division, what we would like to see from, from your council is one, which I think most of you have already got based on some of the things I've saw, just a basic understanding of what we do as police officers, right? So that's the most important thing because a lot of people don't know what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And I feel like so far you guys have got at least the basic knowledge and understanding from what I understand. Chief, they've been, you've all been to the academy. I think I, I, I was briefed on that, right? So, you know, the, the foundational part is good. The second thing that most people, and again, this is in general terms, but this is just from most people that I've talked to within our division that would like to see from you, is not only once you learn the things that we're doing, you know, actually get out into the community and express the things that you have learned and, and teach other people and educate them on what we are doing that is positive. Because again, in today's society, we always get a negative rap on, oh, the police are always up to no good and doing bad. Because another thing that kind of, you know, gives us a black eye, no matter where it happens in the United States, if there's an officer involved shooting, it could be in New Mexico. But, you know, citizens don't see it that, as that. They see, oh, it's a police officer in Mexico, so you're the same as here. So, you know, I really feel strongly in our training. Again, we have flaws like everyone else, but we do a far more exceptional job in the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis than other places. So, number one, again, just understanding what we do as a base, which I think you guys already have covered. Two, continuing to educate the people around you. I mean, I know all of you have different jobs within the city and you do different things, so, and it's all different cultural backgrounds, which is great. So continuing to educate the people around you of what we do and why we do the things you do, we do. And then I guess the last thing that most people are, are wanting is if you have questions, you know, ask us. Like, ask the why. Again, I, talk, I touched on that earlier. The biggest mistake police departments make, in my opinion, what I've learned over the years is we fail to communicate. We don't do a good job all the time of explaining to the public why we do what we do. Perfect example, okay? Like I said, I'm a patrol supervisor. The easiest way to avoid a complaint with a citizen, I tell my officers all the time, is to explain why. So it could be something as simple, yesterday we had a, a shooting on the south end, right? On the precinct that I work. And we had the streets blocked off, obviously. It's a crime scene, it's very contaminated, and people are coming through and they just, they just wanna know why. Now, if we're in the middle of something busy, that's understandable. But if you guys, or once you realize we're standing around and we're just guarding the scene, just take the time to explain to the citizen. You don't have to go into detail, but just say, hey, there was a shooting here, someone was injured, we're preserving the scene for the evidence so we can catch the suspect. If an officer just explains why, then that person's like, oh, okay, great. And then they walk away. So again, that's kind of a broad statement, but the point is we have to explain why, right? So if you have a question and you have access to everybody in here, I know, you know, ask why we're doing what we're doing. But you know, that's, that's the three main things that, that uh, I've seen consistently through the rank and file, so. Yeah. Anyone else? No, 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 I, I was still asking the officers. I mean, before we come to other questions, is there anyone else that wants to share? 
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess for me, like, I don't mind questioning the status quo. I don't mind people wanting us to think outside the box. And so I know the first one I came to and just sitting at uh, the tables and talking and going back and forth in dialogue, I learned a lot of new and amazing things that I could be doing, you know, and that I, I should be doing. So um, with that why, continue to question, continue to push us, continue to help us grow. Um, for me, we are a profession that constantly has to change. We have laws that come out and we're constantly changing. At the same time, we're a profession that pushes away from it, you know, and it's, it's up to us to understand and embrace that we are a profession that deals with change and we should take pride in that, you know, and when the people ask us to change a little bit, we have to, you know, because we work for the people. So that's my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your honesty. Now, question, coming back, questions. Mary. And then I think, I'm sorry. Mary and then Andrew. Okay. okay. This is actually for the homeless outreach officers, if anybody's still here. Um, I, what I'd like to know is, what is your impression of the services that are being provided to people who are homeless that are living on the land? Is there, are there enough outreach staff from other organizations that are out there? Um, do they, when they make contact with people who are living on the land, do you see any kind of like quick motion in helping them get into housing or get other services? Because the word on the street um, is that there aren't enough, not officers, but homeless outreach staff out there in order to be able to reach as many people living on the land as possible. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, I'm left, but again, uh, him being our, our main liaison there, we've created a lot of partnerships with a lot of different social services, a lot of community services. What we find in, in many cases is we'll reach out and provide services, but they're rejected or declined. Uh, some people have chosen that this is where they want to be, how they want to live, and they do not want our assistance. Others maybe suffer from mental health or something and, and maybe need help, but don't know how to ask for it because of that. So when we do come out and outreach to them, uh, there's maybe some resistance to, to speak up and say what they really want from us because of uh, some other mental illness that's going on. So, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry. While the, um, while our partnerships are strong, I think there's always opportunity to find uh, additional funding and additional programs that can maybe take a different approach. Uh, the police showing up isn't always always the easiest outcome because, again, we look at things from one perspective. There's other professionals in the field that can look at things from a different perspective and maybe connect people with other sources that, that we just don't have access to. And then the law is constantly evolving on panhandling and, and other things. So we're trying to keep up with how to enforce this, provide, you know, shelter, get people to shelters when they're, when it's very cold outside, when there's inclement weather. Uh, so we, we do what we can, but there's other outreach uh, programs I'm sure we could benefit from if, if the commission uh, finds some that they would like us to take a look at and partner with. Out of leadership in the nonprofit area for over a year now, but the simple answer to your question that I don't expect the chief to know is that we are terribly under-resourced in this area. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it, it, it is a, a situation at all different levels when it comes to the homeless. Okay, another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and, and probably this fits into what you're talking as well. So it's really promising to hear that more officers are being trained um, for behavioral health and mental health services or, and addressing that population, a population that also is requiring a lot of services. And I'm wondering if there are collaborative efforts with the local hospitals to 
um, kind, kind of understand how that population as well is really taxing the hospitals and, and EDs, and uh, are there a certain amount of liaisons occurring to maybe work together and join in those resources that maybe we can complement each other more in terms of, of what your folks do and what hospital folks do? She works with them, and, and we do meet with uh, different administrators of hospitals and talk this through, so I'm sure she can fill you in on that. So your question was, are we taxing the hospitals with the clients, or? I think there's more problem solving. Is, are there collaborative efforts with local hospitals and administrators to determine can resources be shared because there is a taxing of hospital resources and EDs when individuals are brought in, and that may not be the most appropriate setting for that individual. So I, I wouldn't really know, like, as far as the hospitals go and, and how that partnership would play out. I do know that we use certain hospitals for certain clients. So I do know we use Riverside a lot if it's a veteran. They are, they are partnered with us as far as, like, going through a back door and not having that client be in a setting where there's a lot of people around that person because of PTSD and other such illnesses. Um, OSU is a big one for us as well as net care, but the problem with net care is they are a lot of times on divert. So we really do use a lot of the hospital resources in order to engage the client into getting the help that they need and then where they go from there would be to outpatient care or back home where then they're monitored by their caseworker. So it is, it is hard to answer that question because it continues to keep growing. I, I read the, the data every three months and, and the numbers just keep going up. So I think there's a new facility that's getting ready to open up and I haven't visited it yet. It used to be the Regency Manor on Elm Creek and it's a new facility. It's geared toward a, like a hospital setting for mental health patients. And I think they're having a cutting ribbon ceremony at the end of this month, but I had, we were actually gonna go up there for the, the meeting and meet the staff and learn more about the facility. But we had a person that was arrested and then we got refused at the jail so we had to be at the hospital for an hour and I missed the meeting. So I know that's another facility that's getting ready to open to assist us with the clients that we come in contact with. But that's a partnership with. I want to do a follow up uh, question. Um, I think I shared, everyone heard that we're going to add a session around juvenile issues. Well, one of the things I just, again, know from being a part of this community is that juveniles are greatly underserved when it comes to mental health, you know, areas. Uh, I am so grateful that Nationwide Children's is building a new hospital, I think, I think over 250 beds. But, but still, I am just wondering, um, in terms of the work that you do and, and others, do you come in contact? with juveniles more so than you used to, or do, are you seeing this? So in the patrol aspect, I'm not seeing it. I do work special duty at Children's Hospital, and I see it a lot. Um, they have a great staff at Children's. They have different floors for different um, clients, and based on the criteria that they need would be the level of security that they receive. So I do know it's, it's growing in the juvenile setting as well. I do not see it though in the patrol area that I patrol. And I, I work a lot of, first, I'm first shift officer, but I do work a lot of doubles. And I do come in contact with a lot of people in mental crisis, but the majority of them are adults. Thank you. George, do you have something you want to say? We have many partnerships. So for example, the new facility that's opening up, working with the uh, Adam H. Board, for example, uh, net care. However, there is simply not enough resources out there is the bottom line. But I think what it underscores is that the first responders are charged because they're the first there. That's hence the term first responder. Um, they are charged with far more than just keeping the peace. They, they are mental health, uh, dealing with mental health issues, juvenile issues, drug issues, alcohol issues. The complexity for a modern police officer I, th I think you can all see um, it's overwhelming what society uh, places upon that first responder. Correct, and, and I think that's why it, it I, I think part of that is it does take that village 
that interdisciplinary aspect, if you will, that all community partners come to the table and it's just, it's just not a law enforcement type of situation. It is social service agencies, it's everybody involved to, to bring that awareness. And so that, that's why I was wondering if you do have those strong relationships with area hospitals that do have a lot of different resources that can partner with you, but sometimes they're also taxed as well in terms of that clientele. Yeah. Yeah. I've all been off the bench for over 20 years, and I don't, I don't think things have changed dramatically because what I saw sitting in municipal court is that because we didn't have the resources in the community to refer individuals, then the option that was left was to arrest. And so I saw some of the same, I don't know if he's still with us, but Cedric Green was in and out of our court all the time, and it was just clear that there were mental you know, health issues. Uh, so it would even be interesting to see what happens at the jail in terms of trying to refer people um, to where they need to go. People, have you heard about the pink, the pink slips? The pink slip process. So when we, when we respond to a run and a person's in a crisis, we ask specific questions and then we engage and decide, can we have this person go to a hospital or net care on a voluntary program or do we have criteria to pink slip somebody? Pink slip means that we can take them against their will to a hospital to be seen by a doctor and they cannot leave until a doctor clears them. So we have four criteria that we work under. So the first one would be a threat to themselves. Are they suicidal? Um, do we believe that they're suicidal? Are they making those threats that they have suicidal ideation? Do they have a plan? You know, if we can come up with, yes, we, we feel we have a strong case that we can pink slip that person, they're going to go to the hospital. Second one, are they a threat to others? Are they violent and aggressive toward other people? That's another criteria that we use. The third one would apply probably to your homeless population in a sense, which is, are they able to care for their basic physical needs? And if they're living in a tent and they, they are comfortable and they have what they need to, to survive, then that wouldn't fall for them. But if, if they were not taking care of their basic needs, say, for example, we use this one a lot. They have mental illness and they have diabetes, but they don't take their medication because they forget they have diabetes because they have a mental illness. That's a good one for can't care for their basic physical needs. The last one is an imminent threat to others. We had a situation in Clintonville where a gentleman was shooting a, a, a rifle through the neighborhood at noon because he believed that somebody was chasing him, but nobody was chasing him. He's an imminent threat. He needed to be pink slipped. So those are the four criteria to take somebody. And then sometimes we have neither. We have that they don't want to go, they're not volunteering to go. I know there's something wrong, but I can't make a case for a pink slip. So I had one today, just what you said, jail, okay? And what we do, what, what I did today was I met this guy yesterday, was somewhat not aggressive, but he was talking like he went from zero to 100 real fast. And then he come back down and then zero to 100 real fast. And, and I was asking him like all the questions I needed to ask him. I did not have the pink slip criteria, so I put him in the car and I said, hey, I'm gonna take you to the hospital. Well, he didn't hear me. He wanted to go to Broad and High. I got to OSU East and he said, I'm not, I'm not going in there. As soon as you drive away, I'm walking out. So I didn't take him there because I wasn't gonna burden OSU East with that because he really didn't need to be there. He just, I wanted him to speak to somebody, he wouldn't do it. So I let him go and I took him to a bus stop. He had a bus pass and he was gonna get on the bus. Same run this morning. Went to the BP on High and Green Lawn and there he was, the same kind of behavior, nothing I could pink slip for, but I could arrest him for drunken disorderly. I asked him if he wanted to go to the engagement center, which they take people that are intoxicated. He said, no, because I'm gonna hurt somebody in there. So I can't do that. What I could do is I could arrest him and at the bottom of my arrest report, I could say, this person would benefit from the mental health court docket. So hopefully, when he goes to court in the morning, the judge will read that, and they'll transfer his case over to the mental health court docket, where then he will be monitored by that judge, where he has to see his caseworker, where he has to do what he needs to do to stay in the community and not be scaring the citizens as they walk into a BP because he just yells a lot or he's flailing his arms, but he doesn't need to go to the hospital at that moment. Procedure, that will trigger a probate court proceeding 
So that due process will then uh, be triggered in this individual's case. Maybe for one more question. I have a question for you right now. Why isn't this just mandatory for everyone? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will be, I'll be the most honest. Um, this is my personal opinion. It's like anything else. You have a passion when you start this career. Some people like to get the guns and the dope. Some people like myself, I'm from New York, so I like the crazy drama of domestic violence. I like to get in a house. I like to solve the problem. I like to figure it all out. I like to know how you met. How did you guys meet? I say it every day. How did you meet? Did you meet online? I, I want to be in the middle of it. They, a lot of people meet online. You'd be surprised. I want to be in the middle of those kind of runs. That's where I kind of thrive. How I became so passionate about CIT for me is I had a husband that was diagnosed with something that I didn't even know of. I was married for 23 years, and, and then when he was diagnosed, it kind of made sense. Holy cow, like, okay, there's a name for this. So I, I delved more into the CIT world. I just think for me, my opinion is, not everybody is cut out for that passion part of policing. I just don't think every single officer is. I do know that CPD is going to have every single officer trained, though. Um, Every single officer is going to be eventually trained in CIT. I think at the moment, it was a voluntary program. I joined it in 2005. And as it's grown in numbers for the mental health runs, we see the difference that we need to train every officer in the field of CIT so they understand the mental illness component because they are going to respond. I just don't know if I believe that. Okay. More officers each year. Uh, up soon, we're going to be talking about training. Uh, to be a CIT officer is an incredible amount of training on top of what's already required. So we'll be talking about that in an upcoming session. But that is the eventual goal. Uh, thank you. It was mentioned, thank you. It was mentioned that this is available to the public. So the CIT training, I don't remember which officer said that, but. No, I don't. To the public, like as a sit. It's mental health first aid is available. Okay, I just wanted the schedule for that. Okay. Last question, with no follow-up. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, and hopefully, because it's kind of a, a, a recommendation in just the, so, and I apologize for being late, I'm also on the Franklin County Opiate Task Force, and our meeting overlaps, so I apologize for that. Um, but question is for community outreach and youth initiatives kind of combined. When you're in investigating the types of outreach that you do, are you looking at the disproportionality that exists between referrals to behavioral health for boys of color versus the, the penitentiary system? Like, are you able to navigate that in the ways that you are reaching out to those young boys, uh, particularly from black and brown neighborhoods? Um, good to see you again. Um, so, so um, some of us, I think I said this the last time we met, but some of us have family members from that have been through, you know, prison situations or jail situations. Um, I can speak to that myself. Um, when we're able to share those stories, um, like I had, a, I met with a guy yesterday just eating lunch. I reached out to him, said, "Hey, sir, you ever thought about?" you know, having a career in law enforcement. He's feeding his son. He said real low under his voice, I'm a convicted felon. I said, well, I understand that, but I really want to thank you for being a great dad. That, you know, that there was a connection made. And my daughter came up to me and was like, hey, dad, what was that about? And so um, just being able to share a story and, and, and I guess make a connection with somebody even you don't know, um, I would love to look more into those, you know, that, that data when it's presented, um, but being able to um, 
say that, yes, I have that situation to a youth, especially black boys, like you say, or black girls or, you know, whoever, whatever type of um, person who's suffering from a disproportionate community. Um, we have people within our division that are able to um, share that story. Mm -hmm. um, and that's of all races and colors. So, um, and everything, all diverse uh, areas. So um, I would say yes, mm -hmm. um, we have that uh, capability. Um, I don't know that we've expounded upon it yet, but I think that's something that we have the capability and can do. Thank you. Thank you. Um, commissioners, we typically kind of don't give you homework assignments, uh, although we've been asking for you to give some feedback. But on this one specifically, there were going to be some tabletop conversations. That's sort of like four questions, and it was all about today. So for example, uh, what were some positive elements of the current programs that we saw? What stood out to you? Maybe there was one particular uh, program. What elements of the program were most concerning? What issues, concerns, or perspectives have not been addressed? From either what you saw or maybe going through um, the report. Is there something you really would want to add that maybe we don't know about? Um, and finally, at this point, what initial thoughts, recommendations, or solutions would you propose to enhance the community engagement program? So Elon is going to get an email out tomorrow. And he's going to put forth all of these questions for you. So, you know, kind of think about it, you know, overnight or in the morning. If you hit open and you don't respond, it's going to go into that la la land of email where you're going to forget about it. So if you please could within 28 to 48 hours send your responses into this because we want to be able to hear even more of your feedback about what you heard. For all of uh, the members of our police department that were here today from all levels, thank you so very much for sharing with us. Again, I found it to be, to be quite uh, informative. Anything else? then we're gonna stand in adjournment. So those of us who need to try to dash off to our next event, we can do it safely. Thank you. So, oh, and the meeting has been moved. Our August 20th meeting has been moved from, Brian hasn't weighed in? Okay. Uh, we're gonna likely move it downtown. Uh, we need CTV there and they're gonna be downtown late morning uh, to our very nice hearing room and, uh, the, but. We'll start at three. So rather than from two to six, it's three to seven. And I have insisted that if they do that, there is appropriate nourishment for us. <laughs> and that basket back there would not cut it for me, right? That's our dinner hour. And Denise has promised that's not a problem because when you start getting to those kind of hours, I get concerned about losing the commissioners. Uh, but thank you for being here today and for your full engagement. Have a good evening. Something other than a basket, you should have let me know. <laughs>